Coming up next on C-SPAN 2, the House Commerce Subcommittee on Telecommunications and Finance looks at recent disruptions of telephone service. Representative Edward Barkey of Massachusetts, the subcommittee chairman, called this hearing on Tuesday to discuss a number of problems in the telecommunications industry, including the recent phone outage in New York City, which hindered the air traffic control system at that area's airports. The subcommittee heard from representatives of a number of telephone companies and associations, including the United States Telephone Association and American Telephone and Telegraph. Members also heard from officials of the Federal Aviation Administration. Good morning. <clears throat> Today's hearing focuses on the recent flurry of outages in telecommunications network. Over the past 21 months, there have been nine major outages affecting millions of Americans. At some point, an event quits being an aberration and starts becoming a trend. I am deeply concerned that the outages which have affected business and residential users across the country are becoming as frequent as the changes in the season. The most recent outages involving AT&T and those involving Bell Atlantic and Pacific Telesis this summer teach us that too much is at stake when the phone goes dead. For instance, on September 17th, when the phone went dead, the result was the worst air traffic disruption in the history of the United States. Though the FAA assures us that passengers were not in danger, I'm sure that the thousands of airline passengers flying over New York would have been quite anxious had they known that their pilot lost ground communication with the FAA center for three to five minutes. It is for those passengers and for other critical users of telecommunications such as hospitals, universities, small businesses, and residential users that we must build in standards of reliability for the public network that we all rely upon. <clears throat> in examining this issue of technological failure, we are faced with a paradox. The paradox sits before us in the first witnesses, one from the Federal Communications Commission and one from the Federal Aviation Administration. The FCC since 1934 has regulated reasonable rates and paid precious little attention to standards of network quality. For most of that time, while AT&T served as a vertically integrated telephone monolith, this laissez-faire regime worked. Dramatic developments in technology and the emergence of competition, however, have changed the landscape. Unfortunately, the Commission has not changed as well. When asked recently about what the Commission could do to gather data on network quality, they answered that this was not their job. The Commission's proclivity to simply toe the industry's line on quality has the dangerous effect of putting quality on the line. By contrast to the FCC, the FAA was established as a regulator of safety and technology. Over the years, the economic regulation of airlines has come and gone at the CAB. But the safety regulation of airplane manufacturers, operators, and maintenance, the job of the FAA has been constant. And if one looks over the past few decades, one would have to conclude that the FAA has consistently fulfilled its mission. The paradox is that the FCC, with its focus on economic regulation, oversaw a regulatory and industry regime which resulted in a spectacular failure of technology that crippled the FAA, the premier regulator of technology and safety. The message from this paradox is that the communications network is not only our economic lifeline, 
It is also our nation's safety lifeline. Because communications is our safe nation's lifeline, we must be concerned about the vulnerability of the network. The testimony we will hear today and the information provided to the subcommittee in advance of this hearing from the FAA and AT&T indicates that the telecommunications network and the FAA system of air traffic control is more vulnerable than we ever believed. The network and the FAA are vulnerable because, as we will soon discover, the configuration at the FAA Long Island facility and AT&T's 33 Thomas Street office is the rule, not the exception. Because of this threatening vulnerability, I want to know what significant steps, if any, the FCC has taken to address the susceptibility of today's complex telephone system to probable and improbable technical or human failures. <clears throat> Does the FCC even know what components, equipment, or systems are essential to reliability? Does it require the carriers to do anything out of the ordinary to protect or maintain these items? Does the FCC require as part of its mandate to keep rates reasonable, that there be high standards of quality assurance and quality control by manufacturers and carriers alike? Does the FCC inspect anything that goes into the network? Does AT&T and other carriers make reliability inspection reports available to the FCC? We need answers to these questions, and surely we need improvements in the current regulatory system. We also need to understand, in a comprehensive way, the most recent outage. To simply believe that a battery problem brought down AT&T's intelligent network is to commit assault and body, battery on our intelligence. This outage is indicative of a much larger problem in the way the industry sets standards and measures performance. The problem is that the FCC lacks a battery of controls and standards it enforces throughout the network. While we examine the industry and the FCC to discover what has not been done to make the network secure and reliable, we also must turn our attention to steps they have taken which could be a contributing cause to the recent outages. The Commission has pinned its hopes to the invisible hand of the marketplace, placing its bet that the forces of competition would promote network reliability and security. The regime of price cap regulation in which the Commission put incentives in the hands of AT&T and local exchange carriers to cut costs cannot help but have been a contributing cause to the outages Americans have suffered over the past nine months. When the regulations say that a company can choose between putting dollars in the hands of stockholders or in improving the network, it should come as a surprise to no one that the money did not go in to the network. The result has been a loss of thousands of jobs and consolidation of workers to the point where even the FAA and other large users had to complain to AT&T to go slow or else service would suffer. When we look around for root causes of this disturbing trend of outages, we must look squarely at price cap regulations. My hope is that these outages alert the FCC that it must go out in the field to make sure that the network serves its customers. While I am not necessarily calling for a fail-safe network, I am convinced that it cannot be safe to fail. In today's regime, carriers may lose face when they fail, but they don't suffer other penalties. That has got to change. That concludes the opening statement of the chair. Chair turns to recognize the uh, gentleman from, uh, from uh, New York, uh, Mr. Scheuer, 
for an opening statement. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. I especially thank you for arranging this very significant and necessary and timely hearing at the request of myself and several other members. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, our society depends on rapid exchange of massive amounts of information via telecommunications infrastructure. The advance of high technology has streamlined this infrastructure so that information travels through fiber optics and computer software rather than mechanical switches. The result is that America's growing communication needs have become increasingly dependent, I think, on fewer and fewer telecommunications devices. When these devices fail and the flow of information is disrupted or halted, America is effectively put on hold. On three instances in this decade, AT&T AT &T has put America on hold. In this year alone, Bell Atlantic and Pacific Telesis have done the same thing to their customers on the West Coast. However, in many ways, the massive telecommunications failure of September 17th is the most disturbing element in this recurring tale. It illustrates that Americans are almost totally dependent on the telephone, not only as a source of information and a means of communication, but also as the guarantor of their safe passage through the skies. The September 17th failure also confirms my belief that our need for communications is far outpacing our ability to manage and regulate a modern telecommunications infrastructure. I agree with Chairman Markey that the FCC's regulation and oversight of our common carriers has been deficient. It's not enough for the Commission to practice damage control one after another uh, of these incidents. Specifically, the FCC must play a more active intermediary role between the common and local exchange carriers and America's telecommunications users. It's also time for FCC to set uniform standards of network quality and performance for each carrier. Lastly, the FCC must reevaluate the consequences of price cap regulation. This well-intentioned regulation purports to stimulate innovation and efficiency, but this latest outage suggests that it might encourage excessive and dangerous cost containment policies. Unfortunately, the FCC has traditionally been either reluctant or unable to toughen its regulation of the telephone network. If the FCC simply lacks the resources or the personnel to provide diligent oversight, uh, over this vitally important uh, network, then the Congress will take appropriate action to remedy this deficiency. And we've been talking about souping up and enhancing uh, the quality of regulatory oversight at uh, both the Federal Reserve and the Securities and Exchange Commission. Uh, there may very well be a need to do that here. But if the FCC believes that the current regulatory approach is sufficient to ensure network reliability, then uh, I would point to not only the three major, major outages of this decade, but also the 114 major telecommunications outages reported by the FAA itself simply in the past year alone. These statistics strongly suggest that it's not a reliable network. As the largest provider of inter-exchange service, AT&T has been implicated in a number of these outages. And I'm concerned that the intense competition within the inter-exchange industry, combined with lax regulation, lax oversight by the FCC, may have prompted ATT and its competitors to sacrifice reliability and performance to, uh, for the sake of lower costs and higher profits. I hope that Mr. Mr. Garrett can demonstrate to the subcommittee that this is not the case, but even so, Perhaps the need of telecommunications users mandate some sort of cooperative agreement between the respective common carriers so that we can mitigate the impact of work failure with adequate backup systems. Immediately following the, the September 17th outage, AT&T dismissed it as the product of human error. That's a major question. We have the 
Oh, we have the uh, newspaper story from the Tuesday morning uh, Washington Post where they said that the 15th floor alarm system was also deliberately rendered inoperable by tightening the alarm bell screw to the point where the alarm in effect was disabled. Now that's not quite human error, that's human attitude and human behavior far going far beyond the, the simple question of human error and it presents questions that I can't even define and I hope that all of you and uh, Mr. Garrett too will respond to the fact of deliberate disabling of the alarm system. What does this mean? What questions does it suggest? What programs does it suggest to improve human attitude, human behavior? Uh, what kind of orientation programs are needed. Uh, the AT dis TNT dismissed the September outage, September 17th outage as a product of human error and a faulty alarm system at its 33 Thomas Street facility in Manhattan. Past outages have similarly been characterized as minor failures in software or as frequent freakish accidents. These apparently unrelated aberrations, however, uh, contribute to a general trend, which is the unsatisfactory performance of our telecommunications network. I hope that the subcommittee, the FCC, and the industry can work together to improve the network and provide consumers with viable alternatives in these emergency situations. The vital flow of information which fuels this nation cannot and should not depends solely on the integrity of an alarm system at 33 Thomas Street. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Ritter. Thanks, Mr. Chairman, and I too want to commend you for holding this uh, important hearing. Um, the United States uh, still has uh, the world's finest uh, telecommunications system. But uh, as we are seeing here today, and have, as we have witnessed uh, in the past months, uh, total quality uh, uh, is, is still not a total in America's uh, telecommunications telephone system. Reliable telephone service is something most Americans have come to expect from their carriers, and rightfully so. Many people rely on such service for safety reasons, and many businesses can't operate without it. It's a main cog in today's modern economic engine. Yet American consumers and businesses alike have suffered through nine different telephone outages since January of 1990. The most recent one was centered in the vast New York City metropolitan area, but affected the whole East Coast. Uh, Pactel experienced three failures, one in San Francisco and two in Los Angeles this past summer. Uh, in, the, in the East Coast situation, the New York situation, phone service was disrupted for seven hours because an alarm system failed to indicate that certain batteries needed recharging. Uh, the gentleman from New York talked about the uh, human error uh, that AT&T described and or he mentioned uh, human attitude or behavior. Human error, attitude, behavior, none of the above is any longer an excuse for breakdown. Reliability and total quality is required. Zero defects is required in these systems and if we don't have it we have got to figure out why we don't have it and what are the parameters of the system that need to be changed to achieve complete and total quality. In the New York City situation, phone service into and out of the New York metropolitan area's three major airports was disrupted, thereby crippling air traffic in the area. This represents a significant safety hazard that cannot be allowed to happen again. The United States is said to be the leading innovator in providing telecommunication services. I, I believe that. And, uh, but we have to ensure that that notion is a reality. Uh, total quality is the essential ingredient to the managing of complex systems. Zero defects are required. Or if there are defects, the redundancy must be there to compensate for the defects. 
And we need to know how far our telephone systems have gone towards bringing total quality to its services. Mr. Chairman, I'm also interested in how the FCC oversees the provision of quality and total quality by our phone companies, and how the FCC views total quality and reliability of our phone systems. So uh, I want to commend you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this important hearing. I would hope that uh, the regulatory posture that we have assumed, which is price caps, is not the cause of, of some of these breakdowns. I would hope that it is due to the increasing sophistication, complexity, volume, but that if it is not the regulatory regime, what is it and what is being done uh, to counter it and make sure it doesn't happen again. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back at this time. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Fields. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, when you travel throughout the world, you realize very quickly that America enjoys the finest telecommunication system in the world. And that doesn't mean that we don't have problems. And it certainly doesn't mean that we can't improve. And I hope uh, that the purpose and the focus of today's hearing is not only that we can improve, but also if there are problems out there that require fixing, whether it's on the part of industry, whether it's on the part of our administrative agencies, or whether it's on the part of Congress, that that's going to be our focus. Mr. Chairman, I think it, this is an important hearing, and I certainly appreciate you calling this hearing. Thank you, gentlemen. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the ranking minority member, the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Rinaldo. Uh, thank you very much, much, Mr. Chairman. We're here this morning to address a subject of extreme importance to American consumers and businesses alike, the reliability of America's telephone network. Since January of 1990, telephone service has been seriously disrupted nine different times. This is completely unacceptable for a nation which is supposed to be the premier leader in providing basic and enhanced telecommunication service. The health and safety of many individuals depends upon their ability to reach for a phone, and in some cases to dial immediately for help and assistance. In the last year and a half, it has too often been the case that those individuals reached for the phone and unfortunately heard nothing on the other end. Reliable telephone service is also crucial to the day-to-day -day operations of the American economy. I can think of few, if any, American businesses that don't rely on telephone service. It is a business's lifeline in a world economy that demands information as soon as possible. Every time phone service is disrupted, business suffers. In addition to several outages that have crippled the nation's long-distance network in various regions of the country, problems have also occurred in the local exchange network. This summer, between June 10th and July 2nd, there were six different outages in the country's local network. On July 9th, the subcommittee held a briefing on these outages and discovered that they were due to a software problem that resulted in improper instructions to a new transmission technology called Signaling System 7, which routes calls. The company that manufactures the software that caused this summer's network problems has stated that it has engineered a software change to prevent similar outages. Today, we'll be, hear be hearing from various entities on the subject of these outages. The FCC will discuss its notice for proposed rulemaking, which was recently issued. The proposed rule would require common carriers to notify the Commission within 90 minutes of any serious network outage. In notifying the Commission, the carrier would be required to supply pertinent information concerning the details of the outage, such as its cause, duration, location, the number of calls disrupted, and the corrective action taken by the carrier. We'll also hear from the Federal Aviation Administration. 
Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for inviting the FAA today because their views on this most recent outage are crucial for us to gain a fuller understanding of the implications that phone outages have on a matter of vital concern to all Americans, travel safety. The FAA has been attempting to renegotiate its contract in order to ensure that its networks operate at all times with a reliable backup system. The recent outage in the New York area amplifies this point, and the FAA must take corrective action. Mr. Chairman, we're also here to discuss legislative proposals to improve network quality. I know that you have worked diligently in drafting legislation to ensure that common carriers meet universal service objectives, while at the same time continuing to upgrade their network facilities. I want to commend you for that effort. I feel it's very important. Millions of American consumers and businesses rely on our telephone network. They expect and demand that the network will be reliable and completely dependable. And this committee must ensure, one way or another, that they get nothing else. Because in my view, there is no acceptable excuse for what happened on September 17th. Mr. Chairman, thank you, and I yield back the balance of my time. Gentlemen's uh, time has expired. Are there any other members seeking recognition? Gentlemen from ten uh, Louisiana, seek recognition. Great. Then uh, all time for opening statements by our uh, subcommittee members has uh, expired. And now we'll turn to our first panel, which uh, consists of Mr. Norbert Owens, who is the Deputy An uh, Associate Administrator for Air Traffic from the Federal Aviation Administration, and Mr. Rick Firestone, who is the Common Carrier Bureau Chief from the Federal Communications Commission. Um, this is, gentlemen, a very, very serious uh, issue, uh, the most uh, significant disruption of uh, air traffic uh, in the uh, history of our country. Uh, why don't we begin with you, Mr. Owens? Uh, you can lay out the case for us, and then uh, Mr. Firestone uh, can tell us uh, how uh, they view it from the perspective of the Federal Communications Commission. Whenever you feel comfortable, Mr. Owens, pull up to the microphone and uh, please begin. Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee, I welcome the opportunity to appear before the subcommittee to discuss the effects of the recent AT&T telecommunications outage on our air traffic control system and to provide some background on the direction the FAA is taking in our telecommunication program to ensure the safety and integrity of the national airspace system. Joining me today is uh, Edward Kelly, Deputy Associate Administrator for Airway Facilities. Telecommunications are a vital link in the FAA's air traffic control system. We must rely heavily on our telecommunications network to relay both voice communications and data from our radars and other navigational aids to and from our air traffic control facilities. Disruptions in these key services have a significant impact on air traffic operations, increasing delays to the traveling public and making the job of delivering safe and efficient air traffic control services more difficult for our workforce. The FAA's telecommunications network consists of a combination of FAA-owned and leased resources. The FAA currently has over 10,000 communications-related accounts with AT&T at an annual cost of approximately $90 million. These accounts include circuits and equipment and are leased competitively through the Defense Commercial Communications Organization. AT&T provides approximately 7,500 circuits to the FAA that carry critical voice and data transmissions, including those used by air traffic controllers to maintain radio contact with aircraft operating within the national airspace system. Since our air traffic control system requires highly reliable telecommunication services, the FAA maintains a close relationship with all suppliers, including AT&T. The FAA and AT&T routinely participate in regional and national service improvement meetings which focus on improving the quality of telecommunications services. We are in constant communication with AT&T at many of our organizational levels to identify potential problems and resolve existing difficulties. As recently demonstrated, however, 
outages can and do occur, and this is a source of continuing concern to us. The vulnerability of our nation's airspace system to telecommunications breakdowns is a serious issue for the FAA. Our current efforts to protect our communication systems arose from an incident in 1988 near Princeton, New Jersey. That outage, caused by someone cutting a fiber optic cable, resulted in major disruptions to air traffic control and again caused delays. After that incident, the FAA proceeded to combine various ongoing efforts that were aimed at eliminating single point failures as a cause of multiple communication failures through the introduction of diverse telecommunications capability. The result of this coordinated effort was our communications diversity program and an FAA order on communications diversity. Our order establishes criteria for providing telecommunications diversity and identifies and prioritizes specific FAA services for diversity. In addition, we established communications working groups in all of our nine regions and a national oversight committee in our headquarters office. These groups have a task of developing network protection plans for all major FAA facilities and overseeing the completion of these plans. One resource that has become available to meet the objectives of our diversity plans is the FAA's radio communications link, also known as RCL. This system is an FAA-owned and operated microwave system for transmitting both voice and data. Because this system relies on wireless transmissions, outages caused by severed wires will not affect this system, and it can be relied upon to provide some protection when commercial lines are out. The FAA has begun using the completed segments of the RCL to provide alternate routes to radar and communications facilities. All segments will be available in early 1992, but circuit and route switching capabilities will not be available until 1995. The FAA estimates that eventually over 5,000 circuits will populate the RCL. Another source that is being developed which will greatly enhance our capability to meet our telecommunications needs is the least interfacility national airspace communication system that is known as LINX. Last week, the General Services Administration and FAA signed a Memorandum of Understanding which will permit the FAA to proceed with development of the LINX system. This system will provide telecommunications specifically designed for air traffic control and will protect our operational communication system from a single point failure such as we experienced in New York. As you know, recently on Tuesday, September 17th at approximately 4.35 p.m., a substantial telecommunications failure occurred at the AT&T facility in Manhattan. We understand that AT&T was asked by the local utility company to transfer their operation to backup power due to heavy power demands in the New York area. It appears that backup diesel power generators, which were uh, intended to be used, did not, however, and a transfer was instead made to battery power. The transfer to battery power apparently went unnoticed and was caught only when telecommunication circuits started to drop off due to expended battery power. Since charged batteries are required to bring the system back to commercial power, AT&T followed their procedures to shut the system down in order to recharge the batteries in order to affect a transfer back to commercial power. Although service was gradually restored, normal service was not available for over five hours. This outage had a major impact on our New York Air Route Traffic Control Center. The New York Center lost 147 circuits, or approximately 90% of its air ground frequencies, voice, and data lines to FAA facilities west of New York City. Our Boston Center, in addition, also lost an additional six circuits. When notified of this incident, the FAA's Air Traffic System Command Center issued what we call ground stops which held aircraft that would be departing for the affected area on the ground. Aircraft en route to New York were routed around the affected area, and pilots of aircraft that were within the affected area initiated appropriate loss communications procedures 
and continued with their landing. We estimate that this disruption to air traffic services resulted in 516 aircraft delays. These delays included 374 departures, nine arrivals, and 14 en route aircraft. An additional 119 delays occurred at airports where flights were held on the ground due to circumstances relating to the outage. And there were also 658 flights that were canceled because of the outage. In closing, Mr. Chairman, I would like to reiterate the importance of a reliable and efficient telecommunications system to the safe and efficient operation of our air traffic control system. We are committed to an aggressive restructuring and modernization of the existing system. Progress has been made, but much more needs to be done. You have my assurance that we recognize the importance of pressing forward with this program and that it will remain a high priority with the FAA. That completes my prepared statement, and Ed and I will be pleased to respond to any questions that you may have. Thank you, Mr. Owens, uh, very much. Uh, I would like at this point to make a unanimous consent to request uh, made on behalf of Mr. Siner that a statement uh, made by uh, Bob Wise, a congressman from uh, West Virginia, who is chairman of uh, a government operations a subcommittee who is actively investigating this issue of uh, telephone uh, outages and has been very helpful on this issue uh, be included uh, in the record at the appropriate point. Um, let me then uh, move on to uh, you, Mr. Firestone, again, the common carrier bureau chief of the Federal Communications uh, Commission. Whenever you feel comfortable, please begin. Thank you, Chairman Markey and members of the subcommittee. I'll abbreviate my opening remarks uh, for the uh, hearing this morning and submit a full copy of my opening statement for the record. In my appearance before you last July, I noted the growing dependence of our economy and of our society as a whole on our telecommunications infrastructure. The impact of network incidents that have been with us for decades, such as the occasional cable cut, have been magnified greatly. On Tuesday afternoon, September 17th, many Americans again experienced unacceptable disruptions in service this time at an AT&T switching facility in New York. And unlike most of the earlier service disruptions, which can be linked to errors during efforts to upgrade the capabilities of networks, this one appears to be the result of a power equipment failure, human error, and serious problems with management controls. The latest outage may have been decidedly low-tech in nature, but its impact on people was high. This is especially true in terms of lost economic activity, disruptions in family life, and public frustration. The response of the Federal Communications Commission was prompt and thorough. We were in contact with AT&T's Network Operations Center shortly after the incident began, and we remained in communication until service was restored late that night. FCC engineers were on site at 33 Thomas Street in New York early the following morning. We toured the facility, took photographs, and closely interviewed relevant AT&T personnel. FCC staff has subsequently been back at the site several times, and AT&T personnel were also brought to Washington in question there. Moreover, a team of commission engineers, attorneys, and communications specialists have been diligently conducting a continuing investigation. As this subcommittee knows, the FCC has long been concerned about the potential impact from the loss of a critical telecommunications facility, such as on air traffic control. That issue was specifically referenced in our report on the January 4, 1991 AT&T cable cut that also occurred in New York. As is our practice, you will receive a full Bureau report with respect to the September 17 outage. Today, however, I would like to review with you some of the action steps the FCC has already undertaken and then offer a few observations on the tasks that remain. As you know, Mr. Chairman, the Common Carrier Bureau issued its report on the outages experienced by Bell Atlantic and Pacific Bell in June and July of this year. The Commission was concerned about the adverse impact the early summer outages had upon millions of consumers, and we were very troubled by some of the report's findings. We were troubled to learn, for example, that other carriers, both here and abroad, had experienced similar message overload problems when implementing new SS7 software. Yet the lessons evident from these previous outages were not shared within the industry in a way that reduced the risk or impact of future disruptions.
Clearly, a number of additional actions by industry and the FCC were required. In my testimony before you in July, I outlined the Commission's plan. First, to convene a meeting of industry representatives to discuss, to discuss measures to remedy the problems identified and prevent further service disruptions. That meeting was held on September 12th, and I will outline some of the progress made in a moment. Second, to study service disruptions elsewhere and steps taken to deal with them. We have been in touch with communications companies and ministries all over the world in recent weeks. Third, to establish staff within the FCC mandated to investigate issues of network performance and to work with the National Coordinating Center to address security and emergency related responses. Such a multidisciplinary team has been investigating the recent AT&T outage and an FCC employee is now regularly on site at the NCC. Fourth, to establish comprehensive formal notification requirements concerning network outages. A notice of proposed rulemaking imposing such requirements was adopted on September 16th. The Commission convened a four-hour off-the-record session at the FCC with representatives of the telecommunications industry. This cross-section included long-distance carriers, local telephone companies, representatives of equipment manufacturers, software providers, standard-setting bodies, user groups, and state regulators. The candid give and take that took place underscored to the industry the seriousness of the issue and the FCC's commitment to service dependability and reliability. At the meeting, Belcor stated that it would be developing a proposal for an industry-wide testing capability where equipment and software can be tested in a more lifelike, interconnected, multiple network environment. At our September 12th meeting, the Exchange Carrier Standards Association also indicated that it would be considering network reliability issues and particularly the adequacy of current information sharing within the industry at a meeting of its network operations forum. That meeting is taking place this week, by the way. On September 16th, the Commission formally adopted a proposal requiring all facilities-based carriers to report to us through a 24-hour FCC watch officer within 90 minutes when services provided by the networks are disrupted. We have placed particular emphasis on carriers providing us with information on what steps were taken to restore service and most importantly to prevent re a reoccurrence of any such disruption. Chairman Sykes and I will be discussing greater information sharing among carriers and the comparable experiences of overseas networks in trying to ensure network reliability at a meeting of foreign telecommunications ministers in association with the International Telecommunication Meeting in Geneva on October 10th. Closer to home, the FCC has also invited all 50 of the nation's state public utilities commissioners to a national public, excuse me, to a national policy conference on telecommunications issues next week. Even before recent events, the risks associated with new technological developments, including service reliability, occupied the second half of the two-day agenda, with the first half focused on the new services and public benefits those same technologies promise. In the final analysis, Mr. Chairman, I believe we, federal regulators, state regulators, the Congress and industry, are confronted with a paradoxical set of circumstances. On the one hand, we are clearly not presiding over a steady decline in the quality of our national telecommunications infrastructure. The fact that several of our challenges are mirrored in other countries' experiences and a variety of statistics belie the notion of a public network being left to deteriorate. For example, the growth of Bell Operating Company's central offices converted to digital with all the additional services this can provide, including better rerouting and reconfiguration capabilities, has grown from eight, approximately 18% digital six years ago to about 65% today. AT&T, the understandable focal point of much of today's discussion, has now upgraded 100% of its switches and trunks in the public switch network and 99% of its private line circuit capacity to digital. Fiber optic cable, with its ability to deliver an array of consumer services with greater quality and reliability, is being steadily deployed by local phone companies and long distance carriers alike. The percentage of calls completed by the Bell operating companies as a group has shown a steady increase, now up to 99% for interlata calls and 99.5% for local call completions. 
AT&T's call completion percentage is also above 99.5%. And yet, our nation's growing reliance on telecommunications is highlighted by the disruptions of recent months. Even as overall network capabilities and quality continue to improve, we are also aware that the size and customer impact per incident has increased dramatically. What kind of environment will best produce the mix of services, facilities, reliability, and cost that customers require? These are always difficult trade-offs. Competition in the marketplace provides customers with choices, including diverse and redundant facilities and backup capabilities provided by multiple carriers. Competition provides tangible incentives for carriers to deliver reliable service and significant risks if they fail to do so. Anyone who doubts the penalties for failure to provide reliable service in a competitive environment, I invite to look at the full-page newspaper advertisements that AT&T's competitors ran immediately following the recent outage. They certainly view competition on the basis of service dependability and reliability as critical in today's market. Telephone companies, local and long distance, have the responsibility to design their networks, to procure the hardware and software to make them operate, to implement and test that implementation, and to manage their networks to provide reliable and efficient service at reasonable rates. Our responsibility is to establish policies to ensure carriers meet their responsibilities. I look forward to working with you, Mr. Chairman, and members of the subcommittee in fostering such public policies to ensure consumers receive the most dependable and reliable service. Thank you, Mr. Firestone, uh, very much. Now we'll turn to questions from the uh, subcommittee uh, members, and the uh, chair will recognize himself first. And I'd like to ask you a question, uh, Mr. Firestone. In the, pre in the, in the FCC's uh, preliminary report on network uh, outages in July of uh, 1991, your bureau reaches the following tentative conclusion. I'm going to read from your own report. Although several significant interruptions in telephone service have occurred in recent years, affecting millions of subscribers, the Bureau believes that there is virtually no evidence to indicate an adverse change in the reliability and high quality that have been most fundamental characteristics of telecommunications in this country. I want to explore with you, Mr. Firestone, the extent to which you can assure us that the network is not vulnerable to another outage as disruptive as the Thomas Street uh, failure. So my first question is that uh, the AT&T representative informed the subcommittee that AT&T has 107 central offices that have the power supply architectures similar to 33 Thomas Street, 32 of which are absolutely identical to 33 Thomas Street. Is that your understanding? It is our understanding that uh, the same kinds of power supply uh, operations do power a number of the offices as backup facilities for commercial power, that's right. Now, Mr. Owens. The subcommittee has also learned that virtually all 20 FAA air control centers are equally vulnerable to a single point of failure. Is that right? To, uh, to some extent, that is correct. And that is uh, part of the problem that, uh, that we're working on to correct. OK. Well, if that's the condition, and what uh, you, Mr. Firestone, have stipulated to, what you, Mr. Owens, have now stipulated to, isn't the only conclusion that we can reach is that a substantial portion of the telephone network and virtually all of FAA's en route facilities are as vulnerable to this kind of outage as those in New York City? Mr. Owens. Uh, I would say at this point in time, uh, that conclusion is correct. Thank you. Mr. Firestone. There are two aspects to that, Mr. Markey, and, and let me uh, reference both of them. First, there are individual uh, points of vulnerability within networks. Uh, we identify those and uh, acknowledge that, that uh, they exist and always have. There will be instances of cable cuts. There will be instances of fires in switch, switching facilities. There will be instances of power failures as well. 
one of the keys is the ability of the network to deal with those kinds of outages, to put in the redundancy, the monitoring systems, and the rerouting configurations. Our concern in this case particularly is the lack of adequate redundancy and rerouting capabilities. And with respect to the air traffic control system particularly, in the report we did uh, and provided to the committee on the January 4th, 1991 AT&T uh, cable cut, uh, we uh, drew specific attention to the fact that a number of large customers were able to function in that circumstance because they had acquired the redundant facilities, uh, both uh, diverse Individual routing to offices. Individual customers had required the redundant capacity. That's right. But and noted particularly the general service area, unfortunately, was affected. But correct? we noted particularly that customers such as the FAA, customers with specific needs for service uh, that cannot be interrupted. Uh, some, for example, the New York so Stock again, Exchange again, continue again, to operate. You're focusing here, you're focusing again on, you're focusing on some larger companies or, uh, you know, people that you might have, what about the millions of people? What are you, what are you going to tell the millions of people? What, what should they do to protect themselves? First, there are a number of choices in the marketplace and customers... So you're just saying go customer, to another carrier, is that what you're saying? Even, a, even the, the, a, another... But well, what are you going to tell them about what you're going to do to make sure that AT&T never has this kind of outage again? Is your answer going to be that the, that the full page ads uh, in uh, newspapers across the country by other long distance carriers soliciting the business of these millions of people is, this, is the answer to this problem? No, what I'm suggesting is that the penalties you referred to earlier as to whether there are penalties in the marketplace, whether there are incentives or disincentives to pr provide reliable right. service I mean, so are you're real and are operating. You're saying that it's not our job, it's not the uh, FCC's job, we're going to continue on with business as usual, that uh, the embarrassment that AT&T has suffered here, the potential loss of customers, is in and of itself sufficient incentive uh, for AT&T to make the necessary uh, upgrade and that it's not the job of the FCC, never has been, not our function, not our mission uh, in order to uh, ensure that these millions of people, the, the tens of thousands of uh, people who are passengers on these planes uh, would ever again be affected by this. Is that what you're saying? No, that is not what I'm saying. What it I'm suggesting like is that's that is what you're one saying. of the Let me try one more time what then. I'm suggesting in light of the new information, Mr. Firestar which has surfaced in conjunction with the 33 Thomas Street outage. Is the Bureau presently of the opinion that, there, that sufficient evidence exists to demonstrate an adverse change in the reliability and quality of the telecommunications system in this country? No, I think on balance there are a number of factors to point to that suggests that the quality of our telecommunications networks are not deteriorating. I'll what about, be glad what, to what about these large would, number of incidences over the last year or so? What does that point to, Mr. Feinstein? I think it points to two things. First, the growing dependence of our society on telecommunications so that the impact of individual outages has become far more significant and far more severe. Millions of people were connected to telephones 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago. You're not arriving at the juncture where all of a sudden people have become dependent upon telephones uh, in this country. This has been a phenomenon for years, but we haven't had outages of this nature uh, that, uh, uh, that would so profoundly affect businesses, individuals, the FAA, the safety of this country. So, How did you uh, we understand they're becoming, they're ever more dependent upon it, but let's not for a second uh, question whether or not there has been a universal service. Outages uh, have always for, gener for generations. Outages have always existed. They used to be more individualized, more local in scope. So the risk and no the longer runs to individuals. The risk runs to the system itself. As you go to computers, as you go to new strategies and new technologies, clearly no longer is the mission of the FCC to protect just individuals. It is now to protect the whole system because the whole system is vulnerable. The question as a result, Mr. Firestone, what have you done to upgrade? We had the same problem in the securities marketplace with program trading, with the new strategies. It was no longer just the individual investor that was at risk. The whole market could plummet 500 points in an hour and a half and have billions of dollars wiped out of the savings of people all across this country. 
What are you doing, Mr. Firestone, to make sure that an equivalent problem doesn't develop over in the telecommunications area beyond saying that the ads by MCI and Sprint to, uh, to uh, uh, curry favor with the disaffected AT&T customers is going to serve as a tremendous safety spur. What do you have specifically in place now that you're going to move forward on to offer some guarantees to the Americans watching this uh, hearing uh, that they won't have to worry in the future? As I uh, indicated in my testimony, the, the Commission has taken a number of steps since the summer's outages, uh, including uh, a specific requirement that carriers uh, report within 90 minutes any specific outage uh, and provide follow-on reports as to both the cause uh, and steps taken to prevent their reoccurrence. This will provide the kind of data that will determine whether there are any systematic problems as opposed to individualized incidents that might have taken place. In addition, we have called the industry together, both long distance carriers, local carriers, equipment manufacturers and others, uh, and have uh, explored with them and have directed the, the uh, uh, efforts that are uh, producing information exchange within the industry so that carriers are learning from each other the, the uh, lessons of individual problems that they have I don't have uh, any discovered. problem with carriers learning from each other. I just don't want the um, uh, with tens of millions of Americans to be the, uh, the students in this course. Uh, they should not learn uh, derivatively from problems which they've created for airline passengers, for uh, businesses, for individuals in the country. And I don't think that's the attitude that you ought to take here, Mr. Uh, Firestone. You know, Mr. Moyer, who's going to be testifying a little bit later, uh, uh, notes uh, that a number of members of his association are concerned that the traditionally high standards of service quality that the local telephone company imposed upon itself are, in fact, uh, threatened. Uh, that is that under price cap regulation, which this administration uh, has supported, it may give telcos, telephone companies, the incentive to continue to rely upon older standards that although appropriate for a network using analog or voice band or metallic technology, that is the old way of uh, transmitting uh, messages, are now inappropriate for a network that has evolved into an advanced digital software controlled optical electronic technology. And my message to you, Mr. Firestone, is that we expect changes uh, in the attitude of the FCC towards these problems. We're not going to be satisfied with uh, little seminars that are given to these companies uh, hoping that there'll be a proper exchange of information amongst them. Uh, we won't be happy until the information which you are going to gather from all of these various uh, parties is in your hands and then you tell us what you're going to do with it. We don't if, need any more studies, Mr. Firestone. If I could, let me respond to two parts of, of your question. First, the price cap portion. Uh, one important thing to recognize in the break from rate of return regulation, the former system of regulation, to price cap regulation, was that under rate of return, a carrier was guaranteed a return on its investment whether customers went elsewhere with their business, whether customers turned to competitors, whether customers uh, uh, chose other means of doing business rather than using telecommunications. Uh, they were guaranteed with the remaining customers a return on their investment nonetheless. Under price caps, that impact has changed dramatically. Losses of, of volume, losses of customers go directly to the bottom lines of the company, providing incentives for them to meet the reliability needs of their customers. Uh, whereas under rate of return, they were sheltered from that. The second part, if I could, to respond to some of the questions, and this is not in any way to diminish the concern that the FCC has with respect to the outages that before we've experienced. Before you move on, Mr. Before you move I, on, Mr. Feistel, my time is expiring. Let me just ask you this. Under your uh, economic model that has this uh, system s correcting itself uh, because of the competition that uh, 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 tries now to gain a market advantage from the uh, poor safety record of another uh, company. Um, how does your model work at the local exchange level? What's the threat? Where do in, they go? In what other company uh, moves in to take over the business of, uh, of an ordinary American who's unhappy with the uh, consequences to them? 
In particular, there are two aspects to that. First, with respect to the local exchange carriers, we have taken some steps to enhance the development of competition in the provision of local service. That is still at its infancy, but it infancy, is starting to develop. Infancy in the, is not an answer today. When do you think it will reach the point where the every second, American, can you tell me what year you predict yeah. every American will have an opportunity to go off their local network and to pick another ex a local exchange company? What year are you now predicting, Mr. Firestone? I'm not predicting a year by which every do you think American will, be, do you will think have will that, but where Do you think this will happen within two years that every American will have another no. local company? No. Will but, be within but five many, years? But within many five with years, critical Mr. communication Within five years, Mr. Will. Firestone? No, not that within every Within ten years, will. Mr. Firestone, will no. there be uh, uh, an availability of of a, another local exchange company for every there, American? There is an important trade-off no, to no, be made. No, no, tell me the answer. Is, Will it happen within uh, 10 years? There is a I don't want to hear about your trade-offs. I want to know right now what you're promising Americans in terms of your theoretical market Our, incentives for local exchange companies to upgrade their uh, safety procedures to protect against outages. Our you're communications giving me some, act mandate You're giving me some on, free market Chicago school economic uh, a uh, theory that doesn't work in the real world. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman I'm, I respectfully request that you allow the gentleman to, to respond to your question. I'm asking the gentleman to respond to you my are question. Not I do not want the gentleman's question. Th this gentleman has given me a two part answer to every one of my questions, none of them referring back to my original question. If you're listening to the gentleman, you realize he doesn't want to deal with the reality of the marketplace. He's not dealing with the impact upon the American consumer, upon the, upon the businesses that were profoundly affected, upon the safety consequences for people in this country. Mr. Chairman, I am just, I am just uh, right now. Uh, if the chairman would uh, yeah. yield for a moment. I'll be glad to yield okay. to the gentleman. Uh, it is not a question so much of, of the substance of the gentleman, uh, Chairman. His remarks and comments and questions. I, I just think we've got to, we'll, we have to allow our witnesses a chance to at least come back at some point with some kind of remarks. We can't just ask them questions and then browbeat them when they uh, if, start to answer uh, the I will, questions. I will reclaim my time and I'll make the point once again. If he's answering my question, I will allow him to move forward. But if he goes off to give me an answer to a question which I do not ask, I don't need to be educated. I'm asking the questions here. When I, when I ask the question, I want an answer. I'm not asking for you to give me some lecture upon all you know about uh, subjects unrelated to what I'm asking you about. And if, this, if, the, if the witnesses will respect the chair, then the chair will respect the witness. We have a very serious issue here. And we're, the American people want to know, as a byproduct of this uh, hearing and other uh, questions uh, which will be asked uh, by the subcommittee in uh, subsequent weeks, what are the prospects for the FCC to take proper steps to ensure that all carriers in this country have instituted programs to ensure safety uh, is their paramount uh, uh, obligation. Uh, and uh, thus far, we have heard nothing but uh, uh, a response that tells us that the uh, newspaper advertisements of the competitors are going to serve as a market spur. It's now, the, the chairman would yield just one, once again, just briefly. Um, it, is, it is very definitely true that the gentleman uh, at the witness table is not providing the kind of answers that the chairman wants to hear. But perhaps he, uh, he honestly believes that what he is providing is some kind of response to this problem, it being extraordinarily complex and, and not perhaps soluble with the wave of a magic wand and the reinstitution of some kind of hyper-regulatory process. I, I'm not, again, I don't even want to comment on the substance. I, I think the gentleman may have uh, some kind of response that deserves listening to. And, and so I'll, I'll, I'll yield back to the chairman. I'll be glad to yield to the gentleman. I, I think uh, we heard them, uh, let the gentleman go on with the answer, but I hope that the gentleman, the witness, gets the message. The message is simply this, that every time there's been one of these outages, we've been told time and time again, in effect, that studies are underway. And I, for one, feel compelled to join the chairman in saying that we're sick and fed up and tired with studies. What we want to know, very simply, Mr. Firestone, and I think what the chairman wants to know is, what actions are you taking outside of studies to prevent a reoccurrence of this problem and to ensure reliability in our telephone network? Is that it, Mr. Chairman? I thank the gentleman very much. I couldn't have put it better myself. And I'll tell you what, my time has expired, and I'll leave it to 
uh, other members to allow you to give whatever answers you want to give on their time. Uh, I now recognize the gentleman and, from And New we Jersey, all get 15 minutes, right, Mr. Chairman? Uh, when you become chairman, yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm, 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 the gentleman from Thank you for uh, the New kind Jersey, Mr. Mr. Ronaldo. Let me, let me go back a step, Mr. Firestone. The AT&T phone outage in January 1990 was due to a software problem. The FCC acknowledged that fact. Now, was the defect in that software at all related to the type of defect found in the software of the Bell Operating Companies this past summer? The software was in Signaling System 7 implementation in both the AT&T case and the Bell Atlantic and Pacific Telesis cases. It was similar in that regard. It was different software produced by a different company in different circumstances and implemented differently. There were both flaws in software in implementing Signaling System 7. One now, of the steps we took in reaction to the similarity was to increase the information flow within the industry so that as Co companies learn that yeah, but, implementation was a you know, problem, they could work together problem. on you know, it. You're going to use up all the time telling me about uh, uh, theoretical things. What I want to know is if the software defect, and I'll accept your answer, if the software defect from January 1990 was similar to the software defect this past summer, why didn't the Commission take strong action to prevent that same type of software defect from becoming another problem again as it did last summer. It happened in January and it happened again in the summer and there was nothing intervening. What we want, what the American public demands is action so it doesn't happen again. And the same thing in effect or almost the same thing happened again in the summer and I don't know what, if any, firm action the Commission took in that case. The similarity was they were both software defects in the signaling system architecture. However, they were produced by different companies, procured by different companies, tested by different companies, and what led to those problems was not necessarily uh, indicative of a common problem. AT&T changed its testing of software after its uh, outage uh, and took a number of other steps directed at its problem. Uh, Digital Switch Corporation, which produced the software that led to the summer outages, uh, testified in front of this committee that it had not tested the specific software that had been put into the, the uh, network uh, at that point. Uh, the lack of adequate testing is a matter of great concern to us. Uh, what have you done about it? We have been working with the carriers to improve their testing capabilities. The FCC cannot test software being put into the network on its own. But it's been this almost a year, you know, it's been January 1990, you say you've been working with the carriers. Shouldn't we have at least put into effect by now perhaps a uniformity of standards for software based on your observations and what's taking place? The software is by no means uniform. There are I didn't standards say the that exist. Was uniform. I said the testing standards could be uniform. You could have a testing model set up. You could prescribe different tests that should be undertaken. As a result, have you done any of that? As a result of the September 12th meeting that was convened at the FCC, there is an industry wide testing proposal being prepared right now that will require the cooperation and the involvement of long distance carriers, local carriers, and manufacturers all in putting together that kind of testing capability. That is exactly what, what is being FCC developed right done? now. That was my question. We were the catalyst, we were the facilitator behind getting all those parties together to put the facilities and, and uh, uh, investment necessary to create that kind of testing capability. And so in other words, it took you almost a year to act as the catalyst, and we still don't have this yet. No, the indication was that as a result of this summer's outages, it was clear that there was a problem that dealt with multiple networks. No, I'm going back not to that there was an Not that there was an individual problem within uh, uh, software that was produced by one company and used wholly within that company's facilities. This was a difference of, of software that was produced and being used by multiple companies. It was the need for an industry-wide testing capability that became clear uh, as a result of the summer's outages, as opposed to one company's testing of its own equipment. All right, when will you have an industry-wide testing capability or a standard that we could look at? The 
proposal is due in oh, 60 days from September 12th, so uh, in about another six weeks. Uh, the proposal should be... Uh, the proposal circulated. is out there now? No, the proposal is being circulated to the inter-exchange carriers, the long-distance carriers, the local carriers, Mr. and Chairman, the manufacturers. Mr. Chairman, request unanimous consent that the pros... Mr. Chairman, before you leave, <laughs> I would like to request unanimous consent that the proposal that Mr. Firestone stated is circulating be inserted in the record of this hearing. No. I said it was being prepared now. Oh, it would I, be I thought you said a little while ago it was being circulated. No, it, is, the, the, it is being prepared within the industry, putting together the industry capabilities to test this kind of equipment and will be circulated. And is, the due date on it was 60 days from September 12th. All right, let me ask you one more question before my time runs out. The proposed rule that the Commission recently released asks common carriers to supply the FCC with various types of information within 90 minutes of any serious phone outage, including the date and time of the outage and the number of calls affected. Is that correct? Yes. Now, while this type of information I've, I'm, I'm willing to concede may be useful for purposes of understanding the causes of outages after the fact, what is the Commission doing to prevent outages from occurring in the first instance? You understand that question? Yes. All right. Part of the reason for getting the detailed reporting that we're talking about in that uh, notice is it enables us to look to see whether there are any systematic problems. Whether there are problems within a company, whether there are problems across industry that, that require action to be dealt with. Uh, there will always be an instance of a construction crew with a, a backhoe digging up a cable. There will always be uh, instances of a fire, fire. in a building. Okay, I knew you were but, say that. but there, whether there are systematic problems, such as the software problem we've been discussing, is part of what this information will provide to us, and whether there are specific areas that require additional action. Can you give me the, a date when you expect to have something that we can look at that we would consider uh, obviously aimed at preventing outages? What I can do now is provide some of the data and statistics that we have prepared looking at whether there is evidence of a deterioration of the network. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't outages and as I said we are very concerned about the individual outages but what we have been studying and, and, and have data on is whether there is evidence of the, the carriers allowing the networks to deteriorate whether there is a loss of service quality in general or whether these outages, as troublesome and as, in fact, potentially devastating as they are individually, and dangerous. Are, are, yes, they are, are, are evidence of network deterioration. If I could, I will show you some of those uh, graphs right now that we put together well, we, we to evidence time, not right? having the, a total deterioration of the I'm network. running out of time. Let me just ask Mr. Owens a question before I am out of time. Mr. Owens, what internal measures is the, oh, let, me, let me back up a minute. It's, it's, uh, this my yeah. Yeah. Here's my question, Mr. Owens. It's my understanding that AT&T originally reported to the FAA that the outage would last only 30 minutes. This figure later on, according to my understanding of the scenario, the figure was revised to an indefinite period of time. What steps to ameliorate the problem would the FAA have taken if, at, if it had initially been alerted as to the true seriousness of the problem and the length that it was going to take, and was the FAA later alerted that the problem was more serious than originally contemplated? Well, Congressman uh, Ronaldo, uh, actually, from an operational sense, the FAA would not have reacted any differently if we initially had understood that this would be a five-hour delay. Our immediate operational reaction was to stabilize the air traffic situation within the New York area. And by accomplishing that, what we did was stop any aircraft from entering that airspace, and that those aircraft already in that airspace were accommodated at, at the airports uh, that were in the New York area. So we, we attempted to sterilize that airspace. Once that was done, we implemented a contingency, a plan to allow a certain number of aircraft to use that airspace inbound and outbound from New York, depending on what our capabilities were. 
you're right that, uh, that AT&T did come back after the initial uh, report that uh, this would probably be a 30-minute outage and, and did say that it would be indefinite. Uh, but our operational plan was at that time in effect. And when they came back to us uh, somewhere around 11 o'clock that evening and said it would be an now another 30 minutes and uh, all service should be back, uh, we were in a position to adjust uh, at a moment's notice once the uh, frequencies and landlines were back in service. And uh, Mr. Kelly, if you have anything to add to that. Uh, no, sir. <coughs> okay. Thank you very much, and thank you, Mr. Firestone. Uh, Mr. Firestone, Mr. Firestone, you've uh, undoubtedly perceived on both sides of the aisle here uh, a degree of impatience uh, with your agency and a feeling that there isn't enough zip and zest and uh, muscle tone once one of these emergencies happen. And before that, in uh, assuring that the standards and, and desired uh, levels of quality and reliability are established through long-term planning. There's a, a lessening degree of patience. Uh, I think you may have detected that. Now, you have traditionally permitted the uh, telecommunications industry to develop its own standards for quality and reliability, and the spate of recent failures that we've experienced that you've been hearing about all this morning suggests that this hands-off policy is neither productive nor realistic. It seems to all of us that more leadership uh, from the FCC is required. Uh, now, can you tell us, do you think you should continue sitting back and letting these fierce competitors uh, determine uh, uh, standards of uh, reliability and quality and meeting after meeting after meeting over which you apparently have no control? Or is it time for some leadership in the FCC? Uh, to produce standards and rulemaking which the common carriers must meet. In other words, where is the, the leadership going to come from? Who is going to guard the guards? Who is going to provide the prod? Standards throughout the economy, not merely in telecommunications, are typically developed by voluntary industry standards organizations, usually under the American National Standards. Well, Institute. now wait a minute. But uh, beyond that... We, uh, we've had a lot of problems with this general lackadaisical attitude that the industry is going to develop standards. Sometimes they can and sometimes it's appropriate to let them try. But this is a case where it seems to me, and I think it seems to all of us, that more leadership from your agency is desperately needed. Now, we've right. gone through this whole scenario with the Securities and Exchange Commission and the Federal Reserve. They have lots of authority uh, over the industries that they are supposed to supervise, yet we've had the Ivan Boskis, we've had the, uh, uh, the, um, the SNL failures that have cost the American public a half a trillion dollars, and it's because of a lack of zeal and a lack of commitment in all of these agencies, and perhaps a lack of trained staff that has uh, produced these awful, quote, outages uh, in, the, uh, in your industry, in the banking industry, in the SNLs. You can call them all outages. They're glitches. They're blips, where the regulators didn't hold uh, the industry's feet to the fire in terms of performance, in terms of the integrity of, of their businesses. Now, we have the same situation here. And I'd like to get your expression. Have you learned anything from these whole series of adages where the whole has transcended the sum of the parts? There's a greater reality here that the, F that the FAA is simply not doing the job. Yes, what sir. kind of initiatives do, does this whole learning experience indicate to you that your agency, excuse me, the FCC, uh, that your agency ought to be undertaking. There is a paradox, and it is one I referenced earlier, and that is while these outages have clearly been severe and are quite troublesome to us, the statistics we have been regularly gathering to determine whether the telecommunications network is deteriorating in terms of quality or people's expectations whether do it's not right. suggest that. And let me, if I could, show you some of those statistics that yeah. suggest that what we have are 
uh, I think Mr. Ritter earlier made reference to, still the finest telecommunications network in the world and a constant upgrading of those, of those network capabilities at the same time that this paradox exists, that we have these devastating outages that have to be addressed. Well, you know, you, look, I don't want to take up a lot of time with these charts. I'll ask unanimous consent that we put them in the record. Uh, I'll give you two minutes to go over these charts. Okay, very I, I mean, a lot of self-serving uh, statements about how great uh, the, uh, uh, our communication systems are is not really going to add very much to this system, uh, to this hearing. We know we have, uh, by worldwide standards, pretty good telecommunications uh, services in this country. But we have seen that they're far from the best. We've seen dreadful, terrible, endemic problems uh, develop, and we don't want to take up a lot of time for, for you to tell us how great our telecommunication system is. We know it's good, but there's a heck of a lot that ought to be done, and we want to spend the time in this hearing to find out what you, what initiatives you are going to uh, exercise to improve the situation and not spending a lot of time telling us how great the situation is now. Well, I'll be glad to submit the data for the record instead of spending time on it now beyond making just one point. Please do. And that is, it's not merely whether we have the best system in the world, it's also that these indicators suggest that our system continues to improve rather than deteriorate. The percentage of call completions, for example, is higher than it has been before. For I, I would ask the you local now, exchange Mr. carriers, Mr. Chairman, that we at least take one. Brief, you said two minutes. Let's give. Sure. Let's give that chart thirty seconds. And let's see what's on it. Let's, let's take some hiding minutes. it. First, the first chart. The first chart shows uh, the rapid increase in recent years in the percentage of access lines that are served by Bell Operating Company central offices that have been converted to digital access. The second chart, very quickly, shows the deployment of fiber by the local exchange carriers in recent years. Uh, the third, very quickly, will that, show the, that, yes, that I'm sorry, those are millions miles? of miles of fiber. Don't do uh, it so fast that it makes okay, no, I'm sorry. no sense. Okay. Uh, the third shows that with respect to AT&T, it's very rapid deployment of fiber in recent years as well. And as I noted earlier, they are now 100% uh, uh, digital in their public switch network and 99% digital on their private line. And shouldn't that increase well. the chairman? Would you, shouldn't that increase the quality of operation as opposed to give us these glitches? That's correct. And, and why, fiber, why, optics, why we... fiber optics clearly have that capability. They're less subject to many of the problems that old systems and that analog and electromechanical switches as well used to suffer. Yeah. One problem that comes with the concentration of facilities is a cut in a fiber optic cable knocks out a lot more circuits because of its capacity. And that is the need for redundancy and rerouting capabilities that is also being built into the network. And that is what the acting chairman and the chairman are, and the gentleman from New Jersey are really seeking is, is where does the response to the problem come? It does come, I take it in systems of redundancy and bypass that if this central fantastic broadband trunk carrier breaks down, there is something there to That's take correct. care of the 10 million people and that the chairman was talking about. And it is being developed in two different ways. First, AT&T, for example, has been developing systems it calls fast star and rapid that will automatically reroute and reconfigure circuits so if there's a cut in a cable or a switch goes down, Rerouting will take place around it, making it transparent to the customer who will not lose the communication. At the same time, we are developing it nationwide alternative carrier facilities so that customers have choices, and particularly so that large entities with, with very demanding needs, like the FAA, have choices and can diversify the problem with the FAA's inability to go forward with its procurement of new communications facilities is that it could not begin to diversify its communications links and was dependent upon single links and, and uh, individual routes from a single carrier irrespective of the need for the backup facilities so, that other companies so and entities have been able to get. For one more comment, well, question. this is your time. Okay, the thanks, Mr. Chairman. is using his own time and you have about I, another minute, a minute and a half left. I appreciate that, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, so what you're saying is we have to some extent, Mr. Chairman, that was not, not, not made clear to me initially. I had asked the Chairman to yield. 
I would requestfully uh, respect that I have my own the time. The gentleman uh, all is on his own time, okay. and he's got about another minute and a half left. Okay, Mr. Chairman, I would re respectfully request that I have my full five minutes. The chairman of the committee took a good 15 or 20, and it's not as if uh, we're taking a great deal of time here. Well, you've had about three and a half minutes, and I'm happy to give you the other minute and a half or two minutes. Well, Mr. Chairman, I, I, my, it was my, my significant understanding that, that you had yielded and that this was somewhat of a debate as well as just a No, a no, we're, we're conducting a usual hearing, and I yielded to you, and you've had uh, most of your five minutes, but take another couple of minutes. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, so I think what we're learning here is that the American telecommunications system is to some extent in a stage of transition. Very much so. Okay. And we are going from uh, uh, copper uh, to uh, fiber. We're going from analog to digital. And are we led to understand that these uh, rather massive uh, inconveniencing glitches are a result not of the steady state performance of, of the eventual system, but of going from one to the other, or, or, or just what? I believe the transitions to new technologies, new capabilities, new customer demands as well, has created many of the pressures and many of the problems we've experienced in these, in these outages. In fact, for the historical reference that was made earlier, that we've never had these kind of problems before, when the first uh, 1A ESS AT&T switches, the first very large switches of AT&T were being installed 20 plus years ago. Uh, one of the major cities in Pennsylvania lost all of its service at that point. Now, they okay, learned the lesson very quickly and as the other switches were being installed, those same kind of problems did not occur. But during a transition to new technologies, there are greater problems, unquestionably. Are you saying that these problems are uh, to be expected to be they are expected to be temporary in nature and that we will not be going through this every uh, summer? Uh, Both uh, and is the FAA prepared to, F FCC, sorry, uh, prepared to uh, give us some kind of, 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 of reasonable guarantee that what, what, our ex what we can expect is marked improvement over this recent past performance, which obviously is lousy? And, and that is why there is such a, a, uh, an intense uh, feeling on the part of the members of Congress and the people what, they represent. What we can tell you is that every indicator we have seen is that the companies are investing huge amounts of money, are taking a number of very careful steps to improve their network quality, to provide redundancy, okay. to provide reliability. Okay, one last point. Price cap regulation. It was said, and you, you essentially said that under price cap regulation, they can't just get rate of return on all investments uh, in spite of, of, of what's going on. They have to face uh, the competition uh, under price cap rate of return, and investments must be made in a competitive environment. But couldn't you just turn that around and say that, well, maybe those investments all along the line haven't been made because of the competitive environment? And therefore, the redundancies are not there, and, and some of this competition has somehow ill-affected the overall network operation. Well, in adopting price caps, the Commission also adopted a monitoring system to determine whether there were signs of deterioration. Were companies not investing? Were they not putting in new fiber optics, new digital switches? Were they cutting back on those kinds of programs? Were we experiencing more switch downtime, more trunk blockage? Uh, these and glitches. those indicators suggest the contrary, with the exception, uh, and I said the ones we're very concerned about, which are these very large outages that have been experienced in the last 21 months. Okay, Mr. Chairman, I thank you for your indulgence and yield back. Thank you. I thank you, gentlemen. Uh, Mr. Firestone, let me uh, ask you a, a question that sort of sums up a lot of our fears and concerns. It's quite true that uh, over the past half a century, AT&T and the rest of the industry have done a remarkable job in improving services for American, all American people. Uh, and they've become more sophisticated. Uh, they've become more centralized. Uh, we're not so much worried about the normal, routine, uh, high probability, low consequence problem. A problem that may happen frequently, it may affect a mom and pop store, it may affect a block or a neighborhood. 
uh, and, and they're inconvenience, uh, inconveniencing a lot of people, but those are the kind of frequent but low consequence accidents or glitches that our, our country can afford and survive. We're talking about a whole new thing that has developed as a result of the increasing sophistication, the incredibly uh, advanced state of the art, where we're faced with a, a, a reverse phenomenon, a, a very low probability accident affecting the whole system that is very high in its consequences, in its costs, in its devastating effects. Now, this is sort of a new problem that has developed. Let's forget the high probability, low consequence accident, okay, that mm -hmm. is tolerable and is acceptable. Uh, uh, we're not worried about that. What can you tell us about how uh, the FCC is going to respond to the kind of accidents, the kind of glitches that have taken place in the last couple of months and particularly in such incredibly dramatic form on September 17th? It's a low probability, but an incredibly high consequence. Uh, devastating consequences, tying up whole cities, uh, putting whole cities in a holding pattern, putting our aviation system in a holding pattern, virtually cutting off communication uh, between uh, the, FC, the uh, FAA and aircraft. What kind of initiatives are you developing to face up to this comparatively new problem that we've only really seen in the last few years as the system itself has become a holistic system, a, a, con con a, a, a comprehensive system uh, where one tiny little element in it can, as, as we've seen, black out whole cities, uh, black out communications between the FAA and our aircraft. There are steps that industry is taking, steps that customers are taking, and steps that the FCC are ta is taking. And all three work together. Uh, as I indicated, industry has been taking a number of steps in terms of its investment in redundancy, reliability, reconfiguration capabilities, uh, re-architecture of the network, what they call a self-healing network. And I'm sure the industry witnesses before you later will describe some of that. Well, Large can you customers tell us, are taking steps themselves. Can you tell us what the FCC is undertaking? What leadership action are you undertaking to get all these disparate elements in our communication system to act together to reduce to virtually to the vanishing point these lo already low, probab ro low probability glitches, uh, admittedly, but devastating uh, in their consequences when they happen. What are you doing in terms of assuring the standards and in terms of assuring redundancy? Uh, what are you doing to, to assure uh, our people that the system itself, the private sector as a whole, as a totality, uh, is putting in place protections, redundancies that will reduce the danger of these already low probability incidents with such devastating consequences to, to the zero, to zero, to the vanishing point. We have established policies that give customers the ability in the market to make those kinds of choices. Uh, one survey of large users, for example, said that 80% of them now use more than one inter-exchange carrier, mm -hmm. providing the additional redundancy and reliability beyond what any one carrier even uh, would provide. Excuse me, them. you're talking about customer choices. I'm talking about uh, FCC policies. What are you doing with the industry to make sure that these that incredibly damaging, these catastrophic glitches don't happen again. What kind of that, standards, what kind of leadership? Don't tell the, us that customers have choices. We know they have choices. What are you doing to assure that the system itself uh, has an integrity that it doesn't have now? Let me return to the point I made in my testimony, which is the uh, uh, notice that the Commission has adopted that requires uh, the reporting on outages, their causes, and steps taken that can be taken to prevent their reoccurrence. Okay. Uh, in doing so, to the extent there is any systematic problem, and, the uh, extent that we are not dealing with the, the uh, odd incident, but rather anything that is systematic of a problem with respect to the administration of 
the communications networks and our oversight of it will be highlighted in that review. Uh, and so the, the steps that, that uh, we have served as a catalyst for, namely the, the uh, involvement of the industry in changing some of its very practices, combined with the uh, more active uh, reporting requirements that we have and the staff we've now applied to uh, uh, reviewing these kinds of, of areas uh, should help reduce those incidents. I cannot tell you that there won't be an incident of a cable being cut or a switch going down, but I can tell you that there are a series of policies in place that both should help minimize the occurrence and the impact of those situations. Let me ask this. <clears throat> You really don't seem to have put together the kind of initiative, uh, the kind of leadership that most of us up here on both sides are looking for. If, is this a question of uh, scientific and technological personnel? If you had larger budgets yourself for research and development, uh, if you had larger budgets yourself for oversight uh, and uh, accountability, personnel in your agency. Do you think you'd be able to come closer to satisfying us that we're not going to be met with these catastrophes again repeatedly? Well, let me give you one point of comparison. Uh, the local exchange companies employ approximately a million employees. AT&T has about 220, uh, 270,000. The total for the Common Carrier Bureau is 328. So can we do the uh, network design, the procurement standards, the testing and implementation that has to be done by the industry, no we can't. But in, be, in addition you to that, the standards, programs, the standards Excuse question. me. Yes, sorry. What, what I'm asking you is, could you design programs that they could carry out? Could you design systems or, or could, could you define them? Could you help them uh, create their mission to mm -hmm prevent these catastrophes? To develop, for example, a standard uh, yeah. for call completions, the ability of a call to get through when you pick up the receiver, okay? The industry is already producing call completions at a standard above 99%, okay? So that kind of a basic standard exists. But All those right. kinds of standards don't address the kinds of low probability but massive impact outages that you described. Setting well, a standard kind of with standards rapidly we changing need to technology do that? will not affect those instances. What, None of the proposals have been What could before us the do. FCC do to design and effectuate and make sure that the industry is putting those standards into effect? What we have to create is the environment where companies are at risk and have the incentives to do so. Because it is the companies must themselves perform. There's no ability uh, for someone to sit in Washington and design, in one case, the s complex software that would go into an, a signaling system. In another, no, the maintenance procedures on fiber optics. No, you can't design it, but you can optics. establish the standards, Mr. Firestone. You can establish the standards that would require them to design it. In a rapidly changing technology that we have, the standards of, of any one year are outdated by the time most standards organizations can develop them. Uh, to set those kinds of standards through a governmental process uh, would not uh, affect the kinds of transition problems that we have had as we move to new technologies, for example, that were re referenced earlier. Well, I must say, I'm, I'm, I'm dissatisfied and unhappy with what I'm hearing. Both the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and the FAA are into that kind of standard setting. And it, it boggles my mind that you don't feel there's any role for you in making sure that uh, the FCC <coughs> goads and challenges the private sector to do what they've got to do to, pre to prevent these awful glitches from happening. I, I recognize Congressman Claude Harris for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, I will uh, at this point, if you, without objection, allow Mr. Tozan to go before me. He has a meeting he needs to go to. By all means, I recognize Mr. Tozan. For uh, let me thank the chair, particularly thank Mr. Harris for his courtesies. Um, first of all, I'm, I'm always intrigued by discussions of digital systems and fiber optics and all that means for us, but we're not talking about that here. Let me boil this thing down to its elemental levels. We're talking about a power failure. 
an electrical power failure. We're talking about Con Ed, apparently not having elect enough electricity to service New York, notifying the phone company that you've got to supply your own power for a little while. It would been nice maybe if Shoreham was operating and Con Ed, Con Ed had all the electricity it needed, but that wasn't the case. Con Ed didn't have enough power, notified the phone company, you're on your own for a while. And the phone company made a switch. Made a switch to its diesel power systems and its battery systems, and a relay failed. A relay failed. Not a digital analog, not a multi-layered fiber system, but a relay, electrical relay failed. And all of a sudden we were on battery power alone. The batteries were not being fed by the, uh, by the diesel generators anymore. Now something happened that should have warned the telephone company officials, uh, people were working for the system, that, uh, that there was a failure. But there was a failure there too. I mean, there was a failure in burned out light bulbs, in accidental disconnections of the warning systems, of in, 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 intentional reductions of the audio signals. But even if none of that had failed, unfortunately, nobody was around on staff to even notice the alarms had they all gone off. We're not talking about digital systems, and we're not talking about fiber optics. We're talking about relay burning out because of a power shortage and the warning systems not going off and people not even being around to hear them if they went off. Now, it seems to me that we don't need big investigations or hearings or committee sessions or new reports circulating around this hill and around companies to know the problem. It's quite evident. And the chairman points out there are other stations like the Thomas Street station around the country, just like it. The chairman asked some questions of you guys. The chairman sent some questions in writing to you, wanted to know uh, what, a, what a rectifier was and how frequently they failed. Apparently rectifiers failed once it really went down. And how do you fix them? And, and what's this business about using a broom handle? to get them working again, and, 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 and you've answered, the company answered. In this case, the contactors, the relays on the rectifiers are manually closed and held closed with a broom handle to permit AC power to enter the rectifier and allow recharge of the batteries. In this case, at uh, Thomas Street, they were using two by fours instead of a broom handle. That's the kind of technology we're talking about, broom handles and two by fours. You know, maybe we go back to string with wax on it and cans. <laughs> Look, this is serious. According to a story in the, in the uh, New York Times of 9 1991, this loss of power and loss of communications was similar to an incident in 1988 when planes came within 500 feet of the same altitude and within 1.7 miles of each other, uh, Mr. Owens, uh, well below the standard limits of 1,000 feet and five miles. We could have had people killed. We could have had plane crashes because we're operating a system on broom handles and two by fours and relays that fail. Mr. Owens, uh, in the report, it says your agency is complaining that the general government's general central purchasing office is somehow at fault because they took away your authority to make lease purchases of telephone equipment. Is that true? Uh, no, sir. I'll respond to that if I may. Please uh, do. You're probably referring to what we call a links procurement. Uh, and yes. There has been some ongoing discussion with the uh, General Services Administration over the use of uh, the uh, FTS 2000 for part of our uh, circuit ordering. Uh, just in the last week, last Thursday specifically, uh, the administrators of both agencies, our staffs agreed and the administrators signed an agreement that the FTS 2000 lines can be uh, used for part of our uh, So you voice. have the authority now you need. We're going ahead with links. Uh, we're proceeding. It was underway uh, uh, already. Uh, there was a hiatus till we could resolve the uh, technical use problem. It has been resolved and we're proceeding at full space now. The, the article says you've been knowing for a long time that you had no redundancy, that you were operating on a single telephone link. Is that true? 
We, we have a degree of redundancy in the system. It is not 100% uh, redundant, as uh, some of the testimony already today. And revealed. The story says that your reliance on a single telephone circuit to carry dozens of critical communication links in the New York region has been recognized for years as a glaring weakness in its air control system. In is that an incorrect statement? Uh, and, and I might question the word for years in the article. Uh, what we are doing, though, in the last two years is putting uh, added emphasis on the subject of diversity. The Lynx program itself will provide some of that, but already in real time, we're doing things today that are devoted to that, both ordering services and keeping uh, AT&T uh, aware of our need for that diversity, and also from a capital investment Well, let, let's boil it down to simple terms again. Sure. Are you in the business of setting up redundant links right now? Uh, we are uh, to a degree through the lease services to a degree? and capital investment, yes. What, what do you mean by to a degree? Are we going to have enough additional links so that if a system goes down like this, telephone service can be installed quickly so that phones don't uh, planes don't come within 500 feet of each other in a hurry? For the air traffic control system, for the category of services that are called critical, and that's what we're talking about here, we will have diversity, redundant capability. When will you have it? Uh, that's, the, that's the question, because coming through both lease service improvements, the Lynx uh, procurement is some distance away yet. It's only in the advertising stage now, soliciting bids, if you will. Uh, our own RCL network. Well, well, look, look, what we're getting down to, what everybody wants to know, is how long do we live at risk? <coughs> and how long is that window of risk going to be open? And how soon are you going to close it? Give us some idea, please. In terms of complete 100% redundancy, it's probably two to three years away. That's not to say that the critical uh, services that we need today are not being worked on in terms of a number of different efforts. Well, let's talk about these critical links. Are they going to be addressed within days, months, weeks? How long? In terms of the New York situation yes, in particular, sir. because that's an issue, there was work underway with AT&T in particular to create diversity serving New York Center. Uh, by early October, work will be, installation work will be planned to split circuits between two different routes. What we're using in this case, or what AT&T is using, is a radio microwave link to send 50% of the critical services north across the water to the White Plains switch, and 50% going in towards Garden City on the landlines on the island. That will give us a degree of diversity. Uh, it will allow us, if, uh, if this instance were to occur again, the circumstances, would allow us to switch within minutes uh, rather than the hours that uh, took place here. And in any event, we'd have only lose 50% of whatever services are on each leg there. So if you could lose 50% of service? We, we, what we would do is lose on any single leg at the, at the instance of the failure, lose approximately 50% of the critical services. But within minutes again, with switching capability, we could put 100% on the alternate leg that was unimpeded. And you think within a matter of months, that at least critical gap will be filled? Yes, that, the target date for that is mid-January, sir. It's three months away. And work will start on that in October. The planning and engineering has already essentially been completed by Telco Interest and our own staff, and uh, it's being worked in real time. If it wasn't so serious, it would almost be comical. You know, you can almost imagine a little bunny with a drum coming through the battery station to um, make sure we got battery power. But what's being done in terms of those practical electrical concerns? A single relay goes down and shuts this whole system down. Isn't there a way to avoid that in terms of the way in which the systems are, are constructed to receive electrical power? I mean, it, it seems that we were just talking about that. You know, when you get a dead battery in your car, uh, it's, it is hard to recharge it. But if somebody comes along with, a, with jumper cables, you can restart your car. And what I'm reading about this situation is they just couldn't restart the system because the batteries were too low by the time they realized the diesels weren't supplying power through them. That seems like a pretty mechanical, electrical kind of thing that somebody ought to find a solution to, particularly when you think, as I think most people believe, there are going to be more electrical problems in the New York area in, in summers to come. There are likely to be brownouts and blackouts in America by some predictions for a long time because of our failure to address those energy problems properly. And if you're going to have those problems, ought we not be putting some attention somewhere, Mr. Firestone, somewhere, somebody, on the pure electrical mechanical faults of the system? And who's doing that? Anybody? 
I can only speak for FAA, sir. We have been pressing AT&T and other telco interests in that respect in New York and elsewhere in the system. It's taken on a, the problem is to, to devote attention to what we'd call network uh, architecture, Mr. Firestone may have implied also. Uh, single circuit reliability is, uh, is fine. Uh, those figures look good, but when you get a failure at a switch or a, or a power supply, if you will, uh, you do not have uh, capability in a network to, to well, run Well, I mean, that's elemental. You can have the best telecommunications equipment in the world. If it doesn't have power, it's not going to work. And it seems to me that that kind of an elemental failure in the system ought to be addressed rather rapidly, and somebody ought to be paying attention to it. I don't know. I'm, I mean, I'm not an electrical engineer, but it seems to me somebody ought to, ought, to, ought to develop some kind of redundancy in that relay system so that the next time something occurs like that, everything doesn't shut down for six hours. Mr. Firestone. The gentleman. We are, we are reviewing. There's a minute remaining. Okay. I'm going to wrap it up. Mr. Okay. Firestone, would you please? Um, our investigation of the AT&T outage is continuing, and there will be a more detailed report for you coming. But we have looked at that exact problem. The companies themselves, AT&T and the other carriers, are literally spending hundreds of millions of dollars now upgrading their power supply. And in addition, even at that Thomas Street facility, there was a new remote warning system uh, in place and not yet fully installed. And the AT&T witness will be able to explain that, I guess, to you probably in more detail later. That would have had remote monitoring to provide a backup for those alarm systems that failed in, in the building. So uh, it's not that power supply has been ignored by the carriers, by the industry. Uh, it is clearly one of the points well, that, that has created problems. While you're conducting all your investigations and all your reports, being circulated and all your all the bureaucrats are working overnight let me suggest just one thing Mr. Chairman finally and that maybe somebody ought to send some inspectors around not to interview anybody not to take any pictures but just to put some light bulbs back in and just to reconnect some warning systems that have been accidentally disconnected and maybe to make sure that audio levels are proper so people can hear them when the warnings go off and maybe to make sure that in the process of inspecting that somebody's around to hear them when they go off. Those kind of elemental failures are the, are the kind of things that lawyers love when planes full of people go down. And I don't want to make it going to work for lawyers, and I don't think you do either. And it seems to me that while we're talking about these incredible charts and maps about how well we're doing, and I think we are, we're making great progress in a lot of areas in telecommunications. And we forget the elementals sometimes. And this one comes down to the basics. Planes flying too close. Because somebody wasn't around here a warning system that wasn't working properly on an electrical system that wasn't put together correctly. That ran a system that didn't have a redundant backup. Now you can study it for weeks and months. I think you'll still come down to the same conclusions. I think somebody needs to go to work. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, the gentleman's time has expired. Mr. Firestone, when are you going to have that report ready for us? Uh, it should be done within the month of October. We have just uh, uh, gotten some uh, data provided by AT&T uh, in response to our questions last night, uh, and that's part of our investigation as well as our own on-site investigators up there, our engineers and others working on this problem, so you'll have it within this month. Thank you very much. Uh, Congressman Claude Harris. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Firestone, welcome to where the rubber meets the road. Uh, you say in your testimony that the response of your agency was prompt and thorough. All right, what was that response? Uh, first, we were in touch with AT&T's Network Operations Control right, Center and, and that evening. Did, what were you able to accomplish as a result of being in touch? determining the extent of the outage and, and uh, a first review of the possible causes so that we could begin our investigation and determine whether this was an isolated incident or, or uh, whether it suggested there might be broader problems that needed to be addressed. All right, and you were satisfied that it, what, that it was isolated incidents or it was... No, quite, quite the contrary, and as I said in my testimony, unlike some of the previous incidents that we've reported to the Congress on, which were uh, inadvertent errors during upgrades, we saw this as a more fundamental problem 
uh, a lack of adequate management controls as well as an equipment failure and some human error in the process. Uh, and so we, we have distinguished this incident uh, quite specifically from some of the others and are very concerned about the implications of it because it is not uh, a decidedly high-tech situation or the transitions to new technologies that I discussed with Mr. Ritter earlier. All right, and the next morning you, can, uh, you toured the facility at 33 Thomas Street. We had our engineers there doing so, yes. And, well, that was FCC. Correct. And you took photographs. Mm-hmm. Uh, was this a photo opportunity, or what did you take photos of? No, it was photos of the uh, rectifiers themselves, which war photos of which warning lights worked and which ones didn't to determine uh, because there were allegations being made then of lights being on and people ignoring them and other people saying the warning lights at various floors did or did not work. Uh, we took photos of the alarm systems, the audio alarms, the bells and things, of the failed rectifiers, and in fact of the two by four uh, holding down one of the circuit breakers that was referenced earlier also. So we had a record of what the situation looked like immediately that morning. Uh, and then could use that as we pursued interrogatories and questioned uh, employees and others to determine uh, what the real causes were, whether there were sufficient controls in place, what kind of responses the company made, and assure that the facts uh, matched as we went through this investigation. And you closely interviewed the relevant AT&T personnel? Interviewed both the people who were on site at the time of the power failure, interviewed some of the people responsible for management oversight of them, and some of those interviews are continuing. That's correct. And then later you asked them to come to Washington and to be interviewed by senior staff. I, I guess that's what they know more questions to ask than the ones that they've seen. No, the, the focus uh, when they came to Washington was not the people on scene and what did they do or not do or which lights were working and which weren't. This began to focus on the question of was there adequate management oversight? Was this a problem isolated to that facility or was it a problem within the company that suggested the problem was more widespread? That's what those interviews were focused on All right, as well. And the testimony has been, uh, and I've forgotten the number, but uh, a large number of facilities are are either like this or very similar to this around the country, is that correct? There are a number of similar power supply operations, diesel generators, batteries, rectifiers that are similar, that's right. All right, what, uh, what action have you taken as far as any notification to these facilities uh, as to things they should be doing or not doing to prevent uh, this occurrence? Uh, AT&T has already uh, begun a no, review. No, sir, I asked what, what had you done? What has your agency done? Well, part of what we have done was direct that kind of a, 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 a floor to ceiling review of those kinds of procedures to ensure that warning systems are operational, to ensure that uh, uh, if there was another cutover to diesel power that uh, uh, it was being adequately monitored and have begun to review the management policies that led to, that, to those flaws. All right, sir, and you sent out, uh, uh, your agency sent out a memo to, to these locations uh, with, with those instructions? No, we discussed that with AT&T uh, management personnel uh, who in turn would direct what the AT&T employees okay. would do at various As far as the, FC, uh, the FCC is concerned, you haven't issued, issued any directive uh, as a re result of your investigation and the, uh, and the problem of the outage. That's correct. All right, now when you were before the committee in, in uh, July, you, you outlined several things that, uh, that your agency was going to do uh, after the earlier problems. Uh, and uh, one was to convene a meeting of industry representatives, which you've testified that you've done. You had that about four days before this latest occurrence. That's right. It was September 12th. Were any discussions during that meeting of, of, of solutions to uh, what uh, we find it, it turned out to be a real problem? Yes, there was. Uh, part of the discussion focused on what were the possible areas of vulnerability within the networks. What were the areas where there might be uh, weaknesses and problems? And power supply was one of the ones identified as having that problem. Uh, in addition, uh, another thing identified was the lack of adequate communication among 
uh, the various industry participants, standards making bodies and all, so that when problems were identified, they weren't adequately transmitted to the people who were involved in uh, uh, solving those kinds of problems at their individual companies. And so that was another uh, step that came out of that meeting. The third was to produce the kind of enhanced testing capability that did not exist previously to test uh, the new uh, network capabilities that were being installed. And as a result of this meeting and other meetings, uh, this is forming the basis of, and after your studies and other, uh, for this uh, proposed rule that you, you've, uh, you've told us about. The proposed rule is in addition to those steps, and that well, is what, what to is require... What is the proposed rule going to do? I mean, it will do a couple of things. First, it will ensure that we are notified and that that information can be spread to all of the people who uh, have... Uh, use for that kind of information, information about specific outages, what caused them, what steps were taken to, to address those and how those could be adopted uh, by others. For example, there was a reference as to whether any lessons were learned from the AT&T software problem of January 1990 that might have aided uh, Bell Atlantic or Persistence outages, what caused them, what steps were taken to, to address those and how those could be adopted uh, by others. For example, there was a reference as to whether any lessons were learned from the AT&T software problem of January 1990 that might have aided uh, Bell Atlantic or Pacific Telesis in addressing the software problems they later had. We want to make sure that kind of information is available and that one can learn from an incident and that others in the industry don't have to uh, suffer the same consequences by not taking preventative action. Actually, notice of the outages has not been a problem, has it? No, it, there is no systematic reporting, or there never has been in the past, a systematic reporting of occurrences or the detailed kind of reporting we're talking about, which is specific explanations as to cause the steps taken to deal with them immediately and the long-term steps to prevent their reoccurrence. That kind of reporting historically has never been uh, in existence and we've now imposed it. And you've talked with people around the world. What uh, information have you received from uh, other countries uh, and, and companies as to the solution to this problem? Uh, among some of the, the uh, areas were the fact that other countries and the telephone operating systems in those countries have experienced problems with the transition to new SS7, Signaling System 7 technology and the software involved, for example. Uh, so this was indicative to us of the fact that it was not a problem unique to uh, a U.S. company or to uh, policies driving those U.S. companies, but rather was a broader problem that had to be addressed. At the same time, we have learned that some companies overseas, as well as some in the United States, have taken some steps to reconfigure their sig signaling system networks to provide greater redundancy and diversity, particularly software diversity. And uh, after the September 12th meeting, for example, on September 13th, I believe it was, Bell Atlantic announced that it was reconfiguring its signaling system network so that it would have software diversity in place. That is not merely two separate pieces of hardware, of equipment, to rely on if one went out, but different software produced by different vendors so that if one had a flaw, it could not bring down the whole network. There was an alternative path available. So out of both our, our review of overseas uh, and uh, operations and what is happening elsewhere within our network, we think industry has begun to take some steps that will help minimize some of these occurrences. One final question, Mr. Firestone. Of all the things that you've said that uh, the FCC uh, has done, uh, what, what step could you tell and point to us that was done immediately after this that would help us to prevent this type of uh, reoccurrence in the future? What immediate step did you do that is significant that you can report to this committee and to the American people? I think the most significant thing with respect to the, the AT&T outage and the air traffic control uh, event that followed was our focus on uh, the need for diversity, the need for redundancy, and the fact that uh, most large companies in this country had already gone to redundant facilities and more than one carrier, and that the FAA unfortunately had not been able to proceed with its procurement to, to achieve that same kind of redundancy. 
drawing attention to that fact was, was critical because depending on diverse facilities and not being dependent on a single company's single line is critical if a, uh, an entity has needs, such as the safety needs of the FAA, to ensure that under no circumstances can their network go down. Well, that's long term, short term. These are not all problems that can be fixed short term. The FAA has said it will take it three months now to get that diversity in place. Uh, the, it, the procurement has been held up for some time because of, of uh, uh, wrangling within government as to, as to that procurement. Uh, the private sector hasn't had that same problem with respect to going out and getting redundant facilities uh, because it wasn't subject to those same kinds of constraints. All right. Mr. Chairman, I see my time is up. Thank you. <coughs> I thank the gentleman. Uh, Mr. Firestone, you mentioned a couple a minute ago that, uh, and I quote, we think the industry has started to take these steps to provide redundancy and diversity and so forth. Don't you think it's the mission of the FCC to make sure that the industry takes those steps and to set the standards that will require them to take those steps? To require completely redundant networks, and in fact to require that each network be completely redundant, would conflict with another one of our basic missions, and one set by the Communications Act as well, and that is to ensure that communications be available at reasonable cost. The kind of redundancy we've been talking about in particular is well, one focused on standards, customers having balance. alternative means of connecting Mr. their Mr. Firestone, phones. when you set the standards, you can make sure that they're not silly, that they're not absurdly wasteful, but that they do the job and that the industry is called upon to make the capital investments in doing the job that must be done in order to prevent these catastrophes in the future. Don't you consider that it's your mission, not just to tell us here we think the industry has started to make, to take these steps, but to make damn sure that they take these steps by laying out the standards, reasonable standards, cost-effective standards that would require them to take uh, those steps and make those investments in a timely fashion. As I indicated and as the data that I'm providing to the committee will show, the investments that the companies are making are very extensive in doing just that. At the same time, as I indicated, it is critical that the redundancy not be dependent merely on a single provider but that for critical needs like the FAAs, they have to have diverse sources available to them and the pressures that those uh, uh, competitive sources provide to ensure that kind of redundancy right, as well. thank you, Mr. Feistner. I recognize Mr. Oxley of Ohio. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Firestone, uh, there was some discussion uh, earlier by Chairman Markey uh, and some uh, frustrating questions to you regarding pr price cap regulation and the potential for price cap uh, regulation having some effect on the deterioration of the uh, network. Um, based on what you saw, first of all, in, in this most recent uh, outage, is there any evidence uh, that would indicate that the price cap regulations have any, had any effect, A, on this particular incident, and B, on the overall uh, condition of the equipment? The risk usually alleged for price caps is that companies will, will cut back on their investment uh, rather than investing in reliable service. Uh, we are concerned with respect to this AT&T outage and are continuing to review that very carefully to ensure that that, that, that was not the case. Uh, but we, as we have looked at the industry as a whole and as to the performance of the companies under price caps as a whole, they are continuing to invest very vigorously in upgrading their networks, not letting them deteriorate. And so we don't see evidence at this point that uh, price caps has in any way influenced negatively uh, uh, network performance. And as I indicated earlier, quite the contrary, it provides a direct financial incentive for a company to provide service that keeps its customers happy and from looking elsewhere. Because unlike rate of return, if the company, if the customers go elsewhere, it goes right to the bottom line loss of profits for the company under price caps. Under rate of return, its return was guaranteed, irrespective of whether some customers went elsewhere. So we think price caps has, in fact, provided positive incentives to move towards meeting customer demands and providing reliable service. Well, I'm glad to get that on the record because, uh, obviously, those who have uh, 
opposed price caps in the past would like to use any uh, incident, uh, even a, an incident like this, or particularly an incident like this, uh, to, uh, to make their argument that indeed uh, price caps are the ultimate bugaboo and, and cause uh, all of these major problems. And uh, uh, I appreciate your, uh, your comments in that regard because I think it's, it's right on point. I understand, and by the way, I was a victim of this, uh, uh, this outage. I uh, spent uh, several hours at Washington National trying to get to Ohio um, and with, uh, with no uh, luck uh, because of the FAA's uh, uh, decision, uh, obvious wise decision, to, uh, to shut down the uh, facilities and not allow any planes to land or uh, to take off. Um, it was a long night, but, uh, and I, I have to say that uh, the evidence would indicate that the air traffic control system uh, under very difficult conditions worked exceptionally well uh, and they're to be commended for that uh, without any uh, damage or loss of life. Uh, Mr. Firestone, I understand that the Commission has met uh, previously with industry to consider proposals for improved testing of equipment and software that uh, uh, interconnect the network. Uh, could you give us a little more detail as to how that's progressing? Yes, uh, there was a, a meeting of uh, approximately 30 industry representatives. This was uh, uh, manufacturers, software providers, long distance carriers, local carriers, standards bodies, uh, and user groups and state regulators and federal government officials as well, all meeting to discuss areas of network vulnerability, what could be done to address the soft points, if you will, in the network, what could be done to anticipate and prevent the kind of outages and minimize their impact to the extent that they would continue to, to exist. One of the things that was highlighted at that meeting was the fact that particularly as networks become interconnected, the ability to test uh, the, the yeah. diverse equipment that would be incorporated and the diverse networks that would be interconnected was beyond the scope of any one company and that an industry-wide testing capability was probably necessary. Uh, at that meeting, uh, Belcor volunteered to produce the first draft of a proposal for such an industry-wide testing facility that will be circulated to uh, uh, all of the uh, industry participants and the, to the FCC uh, to move us towards that kind of enhanced testing capability. Uh, in addition, at that meeting, uh, the uh, Exchange Carrier Standards Association, through its network operations forum, took on the task of improving the kind of information exchange we made reference to uh, earlier, where it was identified that carriers were not learning from the experiences of others. A small glitch in one person's software, for example, uh, did not send off alarm bells for other companies that they had better check the same kinds of software equipment and things that they might have in hand uh, to, deter to prevent that from turning into a very large problem down the road. And so there's an industry effort underway, again, with our serving as a catalyst for it, uh, to, to uh, address that information exchange problem as well. So those are a couple of the examples. Well, that's encouraging, I think, Mr. Chairman, to hear that and to know that that's uh, ongoing. Uh, I would hope that uh, uh, obviously, all of us can learn from these kinds of experiences, as painful as and difficult as they may be. And obviously, I think uh, we're well on the way to uh, learning some lessons from that. I also hope that the lesson uh, does not uh, indicate somehow that there is some basic flaw with fiber optic uh, capabilities. Uh, the worst thing, it seems to me, that we could um, uh, think would be to have uh, uh, some indication that, the, that there's something inherently uh, wrong uh, with uh, fiber optics because uh, most of us feel that that clearly is the future, uh, clearly is the future for the information uh, highway uh, and that anything that would uh, tend to denigrate that uh, would be uh, most uh, unwarranted and uh, difficult for our uh, constituents and uh, to ultimately understand. Um, I don't think that that's the case, but uh, clearly uh, it's something that we have to, uh, to be very concerned about, uh, that we, uh, because of uh, what appears to be a, a number of uh, human uh, misjudgments and errors, uh, that we not to condemn uh, the, uh, the basic network, which uh, in our estimation is uh, clearly the best in the world and continues, to, hopefully will continue to get better. We appreciate your uh, testimony today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Congressman. Uh, we're just about at the uh, completion of this panel. Uh, it's apparent to me that uh, 
The FCC has learned nothing from this experience that I've been able to divulge this morning. Like the Bourbon Kings, they've learned nothing and they've forgotten nothing. I'd like to ask uh, you, sir, representing the FAA, have you learned any, any lessons from the occurrences of uh, September 17th in the last few months? What lessons have you learned about how you can protect the communication system that is so essential to safety and survival on the airlines and the airplanes? The, the lessons learned, uh, sir, have been in, in terms of uh, one aspect of putting more uh, emphasis on the AT&T and serving companies to promote the diversity influences, uh, including our own internal links and, and other programs. Uh, uh, in the short term, uh, we have some assurances from AT&T that the human and the technical aspects are being corrected, but we need to pursue that at our own uh, service improvement meetings with all the users, AT&T in particular. Um, we need to press them, in the case of New York specific, to complete this uh, uh, dual net that I described a few moments ago, and we will indeed do that. And, and we need to work hard at WeFAA uh, as a, uh, both a customer and, uh, and a supplier of services to the public in terms of completing the uh, network review plans at other centers throughout the system. Uh, and we will uh, I commit to you to do that also. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Owens. I thank you both for testifying. And we expect both of you and both of your agencies to keep this committee apprised on how you continue to address these uh, perplexing but transcendentally important problems. Thank you both very much. We'll now go on to the, uh, the uh, second panel. Uh, will the following folks come to the witness table? Mr. Irving Seidenberg, Mr. Irwin Doros, Mr. Ken Garrett, Mr. Rob McCrory, Mr. Brian Moore, and Ms. Marina Ein. Ian or Ian? Ian. Ms. Marina Ian. Yeah, I'd like to get him first. <laughs> If you'd all take your seats, uh, we'll start with uh, Mr. Ken Garrett, Senior Vice President for Network Services of the American Telephone and Telegraph Company. Please take, five, uh, take your five minutes, Mr. Garrett. And may I say to you and to all of the other members, your prepared testimony will be uh, printed in full at the point at which you testify. So please uh, <clears throat> uh, bring it all together in five minutes. Mr. Garrett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee for the opportunity to testify here today. Let me reassure you at the outset that AT&T is committed to providing the best, most reliable telecommunication service in the world. We at AT&T are all proud of this commitment. Every one of us takes it very personally. We recognize that service reliability is our heritage, our public responsibility, and a competitive necessity. We are therefore deeply distressed by the events of September 17th. It is imperative that users of our network not experience again the kind of mechanical and human failures that occurred on that date. Rectifiers should not have failed. They did. Alarms should have worked. They did not. Supervisory procedures were designed to immediately know of a rectifier failure. They were not followed. The result of these mechanical and supervisory failures was a serious network outage that could have and obviously should have been avoided. AT&T has publicly apologized for the incident, and I want to reiterate this apology. While this incident is something that should not have occurred, the fact is it did happen. Ironically, at the time of the outage, the Thomas Street location was undergoing both alarm system 
and power plant upgrades, either one of which would have prevented the service outage. Our job is to prevent such problems, lessen the chance of their occurring, and make any network problems that do occur imperceptible to customers. In my written testimony, I have given a complete review of the outage in the Thomas Street office in New York City and what we're doing to avoid this or other major problems in the future. Mr. Chairman, AT&T believes it has today the most reliable network in the world day in and day out. We are not immune to network problems, even though our goal is perfection. No network is or has been immune to such problems. I want to emphasize to the subcommittee that AT&T has a continuing program of network upgrades and improvements to ensure reliability of communications. But we are taking a fresh look at all our systems and procedures as a result of the September 17th incident. Let me outline some of the steps we are taking to ensure dependable communications for our customers now and in the future. We are inspecting visual and audible alarms one by one in every central office and in locations where key alarms are monitored remotely. We are reviewing all procedures and responsibilities for handling maintenance of equipment, assuring that the requirements are clear to everyone involved with network operations. We are installing many new alarm systems and power plants to assure reliability and call processing equipment. We are investing heavily in backup routing and facilities for voice, video, and data traffic. Regarding the Federal Aviation Administration, we are keenly aware how critically dependent it is on communication links to the aircraft and to the New York and other airports around the nation. For the past several months, we have been working with the FAA to provide multiple communication links in the New York area. That implementation is scheduled to begin this month. As a result of the New York City experience, we are proceeding with the FAA to examine air route traffic control centers nationwide and other facilities. We will ensure that the FAA has the facility diversity and the level of reliability that it requires in its traffic communications to serve the public. We are also meeting with other customers to discuss what I am reporting today because we understand how much they depend upon reliable telecommunications. Finally, as a result of the September 17th incident, we, of course, are communicating with all our people on what happened, the lessons learned, the critical nature of our service, and our commitment to quality. This commitment is one our people stand behind. Since 1984, AT&T has made capital investments of some $18 billion to create a state-of-the-art, all-digital network including many improvements implemented specifically to assure that our customers receive the highest quality, most reliable service possible. These improvements are continuing. We are investing more than $2 billion in capital improvements on the network this year and plan to spend more than $3 billion in 1992. In addition to these capital investments, we will spend over $3 billion this year in operating expenses designed to maintain and improve network capability, efficiency, and reliability. Our nation's telecommunications traffic has been rising dramatically in recent years, with the average volume of daily calls 30 percent higher today on AT&T's network than it was just five years ago. One day earlier this year, our network handled a record 152.8 million calls. The call completion record on that day over AT&T's network was above 99.99 percent. I'm proud of all the people who operate our network at that level of performance. Mr. Chairman, AT&T feels very deeply the need for total network reliability. This is both a public and a private obligation, as well as a competitive necessity for AT&T. Let me assure you again that AT&T is committed to providing the best, most reliable telecommunication service in the world. I will be happy to answer any questions that you may have. I thank the gentleman, and I can't help but observe that that was a very forthright, foursquare statement, uh, admitting blame and pointing toward the future. I appreciate it very much. Now we'll hear from Ms. Marina Ayen, Chairman and Chief Operating Officer of Ein Peshan Communications. Ms. Ayen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for this opportunity. Mike, please. Would you turn on your mic? Excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for this opportunity to provide testimony to the subcommittee. 
On Tuesday, September 17th, AT&T reached out and touched me. At the time, I was sitting on a Delta shuttle at New York's LaGuardia Airport, expecting to take off at 4.30 p.m. Some four hours later, still on the tarmac and apprised of the cause of my delay, I realized that it was no accident that AT&T's breakdown had occurred on the eve of Yom Kippur. This is a company which would soon have a great deal to atone for. The late great comic Lenny Bruce once said, communism is one big telephone company. Now that communism is gone, I guess we all know what's left. In fact, although AT&T was broken up long before the Soviet Union, it would seem as though Robert Allen's work has not yet been completed. Speaking on behalf of my fellow passengers and the 60-odd planes behind ours on outage afternoon, I can honestly say I wish AT&T would have devoted as much attention to the quality of its service as it has to the frequency of its advertisements. I would, I would very much like at this juncture to commend the flight crew on board Delta Flight 1761 to use one of their advertisements, they love to fly and it shows, or it did when they finally got the chance. I remain astounded that one company was able to paralyze the Northeast region. In fact, I'd hazard to say that not since Bill Buckner's botched bouncer in the 1986 World Series has one foul up cost so many so much. It is clear to me as a Washington public relations professional that AT&T has been listening too hard and too seriously to some of my colleagues. Um, clearly, they have been more concerned with their public image than they have been with the quality of the service that they provide. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the lady's time has expired, and we appreciate her testimony, some of it tongue-in-cheek, uh, adding a bit of levity to the very serious matters that we've been considering this morning. There's a roll call vote on, and the chair is going to call for a, a recess of about 12 minutes. All right, the uh, hearing will come to order, and we'll continue with Mr. Ivan Seidenberg. Vice Chairman of Ninex Corporation and Chairman of the United States Telephone Association. Mr. Seidenberg, uh, please proceed for five minutes in the full knowledge as you sum up your thoughts that your full testimony will be printed in the record at the point at which you testify, and of course that applies to all of you. Mr. Seidenberg. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm here today representing the United States Telephone Association and ha as has been said already, the size, the scope, and the complexity of the nationwide public network have always put most of the 1,300 independent telephone companies in a position of working cooperatively with larger local exchange carriers such as GTE and the former Bell operating companies to engage in the planning, design, and implementation of the nation's public switch network. Since the divestiture, the United States Telephone Association has taken several initiatives to support its USTA member companies in assuring the integrity of service over the public switch network. For example, USDA established a National Services Advisory Committee to exchange information and address issues of implementation of new services with a specific eye toward ubiquitous deployment of these new services and assuring high quality service delivery. The National Services Coordinating Group is a parallel committee of Bellcor that USDA works very closely with. There are other industry forums, such as the Exchange Carrier Standards Association, the President's National Security Advisory, Com Advisory Committee, and numerous activities that USDA supports in conjunction with Bellcor and the manufacturers that provide our equipment. The recent outages are of grave concern to USDA members and we support the swift and decisive actions to promptly address these matters. Independent telephone companies welcome the opportunity to strengthen the focus and the processes to assure reliability of the nationwide common carrier network. In the near term, USDA will work with the industry groups 
and support the plan agreed to at the September 12th FCC meeting. Just to review at that meeting, uh, the Commission oversaw some discussion on the Network Operations Forum. They reviewed a plan proposed by Belcor for network testing and interconnection, and the Commission put in place procedures to require the carriers to report significant outages on a real-time basis. In this instance, the FCC is taking some leadership to assure that these matters will never occur again. In the longer term, as the network grows and the evolution of even greater technological advances, USDA believes that public policy must acknowledge the unique responsibilities that local exchange carriers have in operating and maintaining the nationwide network. LECs do not set equipment standards, and in the case of the regional bell operating companies, do not necessarily direct and control traffic. USDA members have put forth a new proposal to establish broad public policy to promote three things. Joint network planning, this is to make sure we have the technical and design and engineering standards. Interconnection standards to assure that there is appropriate protocols and handoffs between and among carriers. And infrastructure sharing, which is to assure that small companies are permitted to work with the larger companies in the provision of these brand new services. USDA looks forward to working with the industry, the FCC, and the Congress to assure that network integrity is maintained to the highest standards. We thank you very much for this opportunity to present our views. Thank you very much, Mr. Seidenberg. Thank you very much. And now we'll hear from Mr. Dr. Erwin Doros, Executive Vice President for Technical Services of Belcor. Please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I was invited here to talk about Belcor's role in uh, helping assure the quality of the nation's telecommunications network. And uh, we've outlined that in my testimony, which will be, I understand, printed in the record. And I'd just like to take in these brief remarks just to make a few points relative to that. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about what we do in terms of our process, uh, starting from the network architecture uh, all the way on through to uh, uh, once uh, equipment and networks are built, what our involvement is. And then I'd like to talk very briefly about our role in the June and July failures of the Bell Atlantic and Pacific uh, Common Channel Signaling Networks, and then mention one inhibitor which I was invited to uh, address. Uh, first, uh, the quality of the network just doesn't happen. It starts with the fundamental architecture of the network, the architecture taking into account the needs of the customers, the technology, the um, uh, industry structure, and quality and reliability is a key part of network architecture. Belcor has a key role in devising architectures and in modifying the architecture of the current network. Once the architectures are defined, they can find their way into standards that the industry uh, does on a voluntary basis. Uh, Belcor issues what we call generic requirements. Generic because they're not vendor specific. It stimulates the competitive marketplace of many vendors trying to meet the same generic requirements that are used by the Bell companies in their purchases of the components of the network so that they can build to the architecture. These generic requirements are first drafted, sent out to the industry, we get comments. And finally, we finalize these generic requirements and issue them to the industry and they're used by the manufacturers in their designs of the equipment and they're used by the belt companies in their purchases of equipment. Uh, once a manufacturer believes that they uh, meet these requirements, we then can be called in to do what we call technical analysis. The analysis is an assessment of the manufacturer's product against the requirements. We first do it by a paper analysis and then we have laboratory facilities go out in the field and make measurements to uh, see uh, in what ways the products deviate from the requirements and uh, try to get the manufacturers to uh, correct the deviations. Uh, once a, uh, uh, the next in the process is once uh, one of our client companies decides to purchase products, we have a quality assurance force that works with manufacturers to see to it that the manufacturers meeting their own quality standards and um, um, uh, and accepted quality practices in the industry uh, with our goal that the manufacturer delivers trouble-free products that will remain trouble-free throughout their life cycle. We also participate in field trials to assess technologies 
that uh, make us uh, more capable of doing the requirements and the analyses. And um, a key area that Belcor works in is in operation support systems. This is uh, systems that support the actual network using computers and telemetry to mechanize the tasks that are done by people. And over the last decade, uh, operation support systems using computers have tremendously improved the productivity of the telecommunications industry in the U.S. In fact, the U.S. telecommunication industry is far and away uh, has higher productivity than any telecommunications company in the world. And this, this uh, uh, applies to our entire industry. In fact, um, uh, I saw a chart the other day of NTT's expectations of their, one of their measures of productivity for 1995, and that's the level that we're achieving in our Bell operating companies today. Uh, so um, these operation support systems are um, uh, places where data are taken, controls are made on the network, responses to outages uh, are, uh, show up on uh, meters or, or screens, and uh, these are the tools that allow us to have the increasingly complex network and still keep it all working together uh, using the same technology that's supporting the network. The computers, that the software is used to run the network, the software can fail in the network, but software is also a key part of allowing us to run this complex network. So uh, Belcor is involved in all of those activities, right, from architectures on through analyses and quality assurance and providing operation support systems. In times of failure, Belcor is called in. We don't have a line responsibility as, as an operating company does. Uh, we were called in, for example, in the Hensdale fire in Illinois. We work around the clock with those uh, working on restoration. And at the time of the June, July, June and July failures in, uh, of the CCS networks, in Pacific Bell and Bell Atlantic, we were called in very early uh, when the outage was uh, determined. And uh, we are now chairing the team that's investigating the details of the causes of the products, uh, of, the, of the failure. And we um, uh, have been replicating the causes of the failure in a test environment. And um, we're learning quite a bit about it. We'll have a report uh, probably completed within the next couple of weeks. It's taken quite a bit for us to replicate uh, those causes of failure because our laboratory is distributed. Uh, what we do is connect up the laboratories of the different companies and manufacturers' equipment through one hubbing arrangement. So it's sort of a distributed laboratory. And this is a bit cumbersome, but uh, we've overcome the coordination required and we, will, we have replicated the causes and we will be producing a report over the next few weeks. Mr. Doris, would you provide the committee with that report when it's ready? Yes, certainly. Thank you very much. Please proceed. Uh, at the uh, September 12th meeting, which uh, Rick Firestone referred to, that the FCC convened, we volunteered, as he referred to several times, to provide an industry proposal for a inter-working testing capability for the entire industry. That is in the process of being sent out this week to the industry for comment and when we get their comments back, we'll revise it. Our commitment is to make this proposal 60 days from September 12th, which makes that November 12th. We also agreed to help facilitate an industry data exchange through the National Operations Forum, which we uh, are the uh, convener of. And as in that role, we will be facilitating the industry um, uh, uh, determining and making a recommendation for itself to exchange data on failures. I don't know what form that's going to take. The meeting hasn't taken place yet. The final area I'd like to mention to the committee is uh, an inhibitor for our full effectiveness. And that has to do with the modified final judgment. Uh, in the court's 1987 interpretation of the modified final judgment, it precluded Belcor from designing, or precluded Belcor and the regional companies from designing equipment. And um, that's by associating design as part of the manufacturing that was prohibited. Uh, we uh, find that because Belcor cannot team with the manufacturers uh, to help in their design, so that uh, in the case of uh, the failure that we had in, in July, we had an uh, emergency hearing with Judge Green, and he said that we could work with the manufacturers to find out the troubles, but it's still not clear whether we can help in fixing the troubles once we determine the troubles in, in the equipment 
we believe that we're still prohibited from participating in designing the fix. And, uh, and so that's one inhibitor. But the main inhibitor is that we can't work with the manufacturers to ensure that their designs will be trouble free before the failures. So uh, the manufacturer designs the product, we analyze their products, but when we find a problem, we are not permitted to work with the manufacturer to contribute to the correction of the problem because that's considered design. So we think a, um, a provision in any bill that goes through Congress, if, if there should be uh, a bill that passes Congress on uh, uh, MFJ manufacturing uh, uh, permissiveness, that it include the ability to let Bellcor work with manufacturers on design. I thank the gentleman very much. And now we'll hear from Mr. Rob McCrory, tele uh, representing the Telecommunications Association of Covina, California. Mr. McCrory. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As you mentioned, I'm here on behalf of uh, one of the nation's largest and most diverse telecommunications users organizations, and that being the Telecommunications Association, or TCA. I myself have worked in the telecommunications and information systems industry for 14 years and am presently employed by Shared Medical Systems in Malvern, Pennsylvania. SMS has a nationwide telecommunications network that delivers clinical and financial information systems to over a thousand hospitals. TCA is an association of telecommunications managers. Its members represent over a thousand companies in various industries and has members nationwide that belong to chapters in Arizona, California, Colorado, Maryland, Oregon, and Washington. Over the past year, TCA has focused its efforts on ensuring that this nation be provided with high quality telecommunication services. The reason for this is simple. The continued availability of reliable, technologically advanced networks is central to the productivity, efficiency, and competitiveness of all of TCA's member companies. The rash of major outages in 1991 has generated a great deal of press coverage and interest by policymakers. However, users are also seriously affected by an increasing number of smaller, more localized incidents. My own employer, for example, relies heavily on telecommunication service providers to deliver reliable network transmission facilities. We have been directly impacted by major network failures at least five times this year. These outages have impeded our ability to deliver patient data to our health care clients who rely on technology to assist in diagnosing and transmitting patient information to the bedside. For users of emergency response services, which are managed by many of TCA's local government agencies, service outages can hold severe consequences as well. For example, in March of 1990, an inter-exchange carrier's transmission unit in North Bend, Washington fell. No alarms were triggered to indicate the failure. This particular unit was used to connect the central office of an independent telco with U.S. West's 911 switching system in Seattle. The outage was discovered when a customer of the telco unsuccessfully attempted to call 911 after her husband was hit in the head by a tree that he was cutting down. The 911 outage was not corrected for eight hours after discovery. The man that was hit by the tree died from his injuries. As disruptive as the recent major outages were, TCA is equally concerned that service quality will decline in ways that are less obvious, more gradual, but ultimately more pervasive and injurious. This risk stems from a combination of three factors. The deployment of new technology that depends on highly centralized facilities, the powerful cost-cutting incentives created by price cap regulation, and telco diversification that distracts resources and management attention away from basic telecommunication services. TCA is particularly concerned about the effects of price cap regulation. Indeed, TCA members have already seen a decline in responsiveness as experienced technicians are laid off or given early retirement. An AT&T employee recently made the statement that a year ago, there were eight to 10 people involved in work with the power systems at the New York switching office, and office that recently went down. <coughs> Today, there are only three. TCA is also concerned that price cap regulation will result in longer installation and repair intervals, lower transmission quality, and delayed investment, particularly in rural areas. The FCC has recently taken the first step in addressing outage issues by proposing notification requirements. It will be important, as part of this proceeding, 
to give great weight to the views of telecommunication system users and to recognize the need to inform consumers of their options when outages occur. In the longer term, of course, the best way to minimize the impact of local exchange outages is to promote competition. TCA feels compelled to note that the Commission's response to the reliability and quality risks engendered by price gaps, which include moderately expanded reporting requirements, creates only the illusion of oversight by that body. The FCC's reporting requirements permit the LEX to maintain secret service quality standards, ignore data transmission quality, and are insensitive to problems in rural areas. In closing, allow me to make four recommendations to the subcommittee. One, encourage the telecommunications industry and the FCC to help users understand their options when outages occur. Two, support the FCC's effort to adopt rules imposing strict outage notification requirements on carriers. Three, promote local exchange competition. Four, direct the FCC to correct the serious faults in its existing service reliability and quality reporting requirements. On behalf of TCA, I would like to commend the subcommittee for eliciting from the elect significant regard, information regarding their internal standards and performance levels. We urge the subcommittee to make this important information available to the users of these services. And finally, I'd like to offer TCA's assistance as the subcommittee continues its consideration of network reliability and service quality issues. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. McCrory. Now, Mr. Moyer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, on behalf of the International Communications Association and its some 730 corporate, educational, governmental, and institutional members, uh, we appreciate the opportunity to testify here today. Uh, you, Mr. Chairman, the members of the subcommittee and the staff are to be commended for the leadership uh, you've shown on telephone service quality issues. Unfortunately, uh, at the federal level, with the exception of uh, your activities, there have been a, a dearth of uh, leadership in, in this area, and we uh, commend you for the effort. The matters uh, of service quality are extremely important to the American business community. Uh, particularly those who uh, face competition here and uh, as well as globally. During the FCC price caps proceeding, which has received some discussion during the first panel, uh, the user community and many others in the telecommunications industry continually reminded the FCC of their concern that the traditionally high standards of service quality that the telephone companies opposed upon themselves we're going to be threatened by the new price cap incentives to reduce capital expenditures on network upgrades and maintenance in order to achieve higher earnings. <coughs> While many in the FCC uh, <coughs> intimated that these concerns were unfounded, the attention surrounding the recent service outages of this year appear to have forced the FCC leaders to recognize the importance of service quality issues. And if I may, I'd like to make some corrections uh, to the record uh, during the first panel on price caps. And that is uh, that price caps before the commission was really two phases of a proceeding. The first dealt with AT&T in the inner exchange industry, an industry that provides customers with choices. One and the other phase was one dealing with the local telephone industry, a monopoly industry, where the customers of those phone companies have few, if any, choices. Uh, therefore, the industry concerns that were raised repeatedly during the price cap proceeding focused mainly on the second phase of the proceeding, dealing with that portion of the industry where there are few if any choices available, as opposed to the first phase of the proceeding where users had a diversity of choices. Uh, I, I noticed that during the first panel there were people at the witness table talking on one side of the issue when the impact was clearly on the other. Um, Mr. Chairman, American businesses and institutions are cr increasingly becoming dependent upon telecommunications. There's a consensus among the business user community that without congressional action, it's a 
quite possible that federal government regulators will demonstrate insufficient leadership to facilitate meaningful progress on service quality issues. My written statement and that of uh, the previous witness from TCA clearly identifies a number of business user concerns with the present regulatory environment. FCC leadership have repeatedly indicated that there are an array of regulatory safeguards adequate to protect competitors and, and ratepayers. They talk about price caps. They talk about open network architecture, even though most of us well recognize that open network architecture is really misnamed in that it's not open. Uh, telecommunications managers who design networks for American businesses have repeatedly pressured their car carrier suppliers to meet customer demands for circuit redundancy and route diversity. Users regularly analyze their traffic needs in order to prioritize their traffic to determine what traffic is critical. It's necessary for this committee to help bring us the diversity that you've brought us in the long distance community at the local level. Users are able to, to uh, have the options of circuit redundancy, route redundancy, and uh, diversity of carriers at the long distance level. We do not have that at the local exchange level. We all know when we go home we have one choice for telephone service and the same at the office for local telephone service for the vast majority of us. The commission has to begin to rectify that if it's not going to step up to the table and, and address the service quality standard problems that are out there. They can't talk about the marketplace when we know there is no marketplace alternative at the local level. The FCC witness mentioned that customers can take their traffic elsewhere. We all know that's not a possibility at the local level. Where do we take it? Where do you take your traffic at home? Where do we take our traffic when we were downtown in July uh, and we couldn't get any circuits? Uh, those aren't f options in the foreseeable future. We wish they were. We wish we could give you a time schedule, but frankly, uh, in uh, my foreseeable lifetime, I can't see it happening. I hope that's wrong. Maybe with your leadership, that can happen. The uh, FCC, uh, and it's ironic that I have to mention this, at the local level is about to take away one of the options which has been available to us, dark fiber services. Many times customers find that their, their facilities at the local level aren't monitored and subject to maintenance personnel 24 hours a day, seven days a week. As a consequence, they avail themselves of services provided by many of the phone companies called dark fiber services, which means the customer provides the electronics on that circuit and monitors it himself at his own expense, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Before the FCC right now, user community just filed its reply comments last Friday. The FCC has pending applications to remove these services from uh, availability to customers. It's these types of things that cause us to wonder in what direction the FCC is really moving. It talks about marketplace, does little to bring it at the local level, and then when we have some tools available to us at the local level, we find that they may be disappearing. So in closing, uh, we need your help. We in the user community and many in the industry want to work with you to get these issues resolved because what may be a carrier inconvenience is a user crisis because we have lost opportunities and lost revenue and that's not good for our competitiveness. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, I thank the, uh, the witness very much. I must say that uh, I too had the, the reaction that the FCC representative in discussing the, the options offered by the market and the choices offered by the market, I, I must say I had the impression that that was disingenuous is about the most charitable phrase I can apply to it. I, I fail to understand the options that the marketplace uh, offers to the local user. 
All right, Congressman Mike Ockley. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Doros, uh, you're familiar with uh, Judge Green's ruling uh, last July, uh, I'm sure, that allowed the uh, regional companies to work with suppliers of uh, telecommunications products to identify the cause or causes of recent network outages and to correct the problem, um, give authority to them under the modification of final judgment uh, to work with suppliers to prevent future network outages before they uh, happen? Uh, or is that uh, a kind of an ex post facto uh, application of the uh, MFJ? Well, uh, Mr. Roxley, I was in the courtroom at the time, and then, of course, the, uh, uh, there was an opinion afterward. And the, the way I understand the ruling as it stands now is we're permitted to work with manufacturers representing the manufacturer's customer in determining the cause of a problem, but we're not permitted to help the manufacturer by injecting our own ideas as to what the fix is, because that's design. And uh, the thing that boggles my mind is if we're permitted to work with a manufacturer after there's a failure, I don't understand why we can't w work with a manufacturer upstream before there's a failure so that the product is properly designed for good quality right from the start. Well, the waiver that was granted uh, in July by the judge then only applied to the, to the uh, former outage or the, the past outage, not to any future outages as we saw here uh, recently. Uh, just to clarify that, there wasn't any waiver granted in July. The judge determined that we didn't need anything, that of course we could work with our, own, our manufacturer to determine the cause of a problem. And that's the extent of his agreement. So that we, we asked for the emergency hearing at the uh, recommendation of the Justice Department because we didn't know whether we can even go and even discuss the design with the manufacturer. So he clarified that yes, you can discuss the design with the manufacturer, determine the cause of the trouble, but our interpretation of his ruling is we can't participate in the fix. And uh, what, what could you bring to participation and to suggestions in, the, uh, in fixing it or to create as best you could or as best anybody could a fail-safe uh, network? What kind of input would, if you could, what kind of input would you provide? Well, our engineers are, uh, uh, understand quite a bit the, uh, the theoretical concepts and the practical concepts so that they can contribute as a team member with the manufacturer's engineers in uh, innovating areas to change the design so that the design is a better design. So what it does is add, to the, uh, add our knowledge to the team's knowledge, which certainly couldn't hurt. It has to help. Under, the, uh, under your understanding of where we exist now as far as the MFJ is concerned before legislation passes, and hopefully it'll pass uh, this session of the Congress, but, but your understanding as it works now with your inability to participate in some of those uh, design uh, changes, uh, what is the, who, do, who is disadvantaged under the current situation uh, that we should be concerned about? Who is, who is, uh, who is, who is being protected um, under the current uh, status of the MFJ uh, ruling? My, my understanding of the current status of the MH, MFJ ruling prohibits Belcor from participating in design. And the bill that has passed the Senate uh, has a provision that says Belcor can continue doing what it is now doing. So our assumption is that that continues the prohibition against Belcor participating in design. The disadvantage of our prohibition for design is the Bell companies uh, are faced with buying products that are designed only by the manufacturer and can't have their R&D organization participate in the manufacturer making the best quality design that meets their requirements. As far as I know, we're the only R&D laboratory in this role in the world that has that prohibition. When we uh, designed the MFJ to start with, and I was part of that when I worked for the AT&T company, we never contemplated a restriction on design. We contemplated a restriction on fabrication and manufacture. And the model we were using, that I was using in my mind, is NTT in Japan, where they have a world-class laboratory that does R&D, and they do design. They don't manufacture, but they do design and they work with their manufacturers very effectively in transferring their knowledge, their research results into the design process and, and, and work with the manufacturers <coughs> to handing it off on a natural flow basis. That's, the natural flow is to go from research, systems engineering, into design. 
and we have to stop at the precipice. Once we build something that demonstrates uh, capability, we can't be part of the team that uh, turns that into a design product. As a matter of fact, if we build a prototype, we have to be sure that the prototype is not too good because if it's manufacturable, even if it's a prototype, then that has become design and then ex post facto we violated the law. It's uh, Mr. Ferguson when he testified here uh, a month or so ago, I thought put it rather well. He said we've got the R but not the D uh, and that uh, you know it's you've got to have them working in consort to uh, to benefit uh, the, the ultimate consumer. And I would make the argument, uh, Mr. Doros, that it's, it's quite clear that the consumer is the one that's being disadvantaged uh, by the current uh, status of the law. Uh, and uh, that he is the one uh, that uh, suffers the consequences of outages or uh, the inability to get certain products or services uh, that, uh, that he uh, may want. Uh, so I uh, appreciate your uh, response. Mr. Uh, Mr. Garrett, uh, compounding the errors that led to the service outage in the first place uh, was AT&T's apparent miscalculation of how long the outage was going to last. Uh, specifically, the FAA was initially informed that the outage would last only 30 minutes and based on that information failed to take any remedial action on its own. Uh, what uh, caused this mi misdiagnosis uh, on the part of uh, AT&T? Uh, Congressman Oxley, I was present at the Network Operations Center when the incident first occurred. Uh, we recognized it as a power problem. We did not know at the time whether that was going to be an easily correctable power problem or not. There was just an absence of information. Once we determined in the, within the, the first uh, uh, well within the first hour that the, uh, the problem was a, a, a battery plant that had run down, then we knew that that was going to take a period of time to fix because you have to first recharge, take all the load off the batteries, recharge the batteries, and then rebring the equipment back onto line. So there was some uh, lack of understanding right at the start as to just how significant the problem was. <coughs> Uh, Mr. Garrett, you had, st you had stated in your uh, opening remarks that uh, AT&T had spent $18 billion, I believe, on your network and capital and another $2 billion or more a year in operating money to assure reliability. Um, just what do you spend that kind of money on and can you give, give us some examples as to how that money is used? Yes, Congressman. In terms of capital, since divestiture, AT&T has spent $18 billion <laughs> Another $2 billion will be spent this year and $3 billion next year. The operating expenses to maintain and improve the network are about $3 billion. But to give you a feel for some of the things that are underway to improve the network, we have, are completing the construction of fiber loops. And these are loops all over the country that has capacity so that if one piece of a fiber loop is cut, it can be restored <laughs> around another leg. Furthermore, as that, uh, as that cut occurs, uh, we have been, up until now, doing restoration manually. But with the installation of digital access cross-connect systems, which are part of the capital program, and a system called Rapid and Fast Star, we are able to restore what used to be seven hours and do that in a matter of minutes. Uh, last week, we had a, a, a cable intrusion not of our own making in Indiana. Uh, that, uh, had, uh, that fiber cable had a number of circuits on it. Uh, with that intrusion, uh, because we had in place at that location the combination of fiber loops and digital access cross-connect systems and the operating system FastStar, we were able to, in essence, take what could have been a major problem and make it a very minor problem, and that was done in under 30 minutes. That's the kind of thing that we spend our capital for. I might also add that in the capital program for this year and for next year, uh, prior to this incident, was significant amounts of money for power alarm upgrades, power plant upgrades, and power diversity. And that's another example of the kind of thing that we're putting into the network. Uh, 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 another example is, is putting into the network something called uh, real-time network routing 
where instead of a couple paths or three or four paths, we have hundreds of paths now for a call to transverse the network. And that's how we're able to get around a problem and also how we're able to expand the capacity of the network. Uh, those are the kinds of things we're doing in that capital program. If you were to quantify this recent uh, outage in terms of fault, that is, uh, for want of a better term, men versus machines, uh, what percentage of, uh, of the problem could be related to human error uh, versus uh, failure of the, uh, of the mechanical system? Congressman, um, I've wrestled with that issue over and over in my mind for the last two weeks. It is clearly a combination of both. We want to have the right uh, technology systems and the right human systems to have the assurance of reliability on our network 100%. Um, I believe in, uh, in this case, in absence of doing anything better, I'd split it right down the middle. But you're exactly on a very important point. You need both. And you need systems that, that ironically were being put in place at the time. You need systems so that if you have a, a, even an improbable series of failures, that you have systems that back up even that. What about uh, investment? You talked about uh, capital in uh, various parts of the, uh, of the hardware and the software and so forth. But what kind of investment uh, are you making in terms of personnel, training, uh, and the like? Uh, in this organization, we are making significant investment in, uh, in training. Um, I believe the dollar figure for this uh, particular organization is between 20 and 30 million dollars a year. Uh, so that investment is uh, significant, it is ongoing, um, and uh, something that is absolutely essential for us for the future. And I would assume that uh, this is going to be a case study uh, within, uh, within your company in terms of trying to learn from uh, these mistakes and uh, I would assume there will also be some changes made in the way the uh, response uh, team uh, would operate in the future? Congressman, that's exactly right. This has been very painful for all of us. Uh, each person that I've spoken to in the, the network organization and in fact throughout AT&T has taken it personally. Uh, we're going to uh, uh, go through the lessons that we've learned, uh, communicate those lessons. We clearly have some people issues to address. Uh, we knew we had those issues. We were in the process of, of addressing them. Uh, this simply provided an added spur. But we are, in fact, going to learn from this, to grow, and to go another step toward excellence. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Gentlemen's time has expired. Gentleman from New York, Mr. Scheuer. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Mr. Uh, Seidenberg, you mentioned in the course of your testimony, uh, you, you referred to the, and I quote, swift and decisive action <coughs> that we must take to meet this crisis. Can you outline to this committee what swift and decisive actions you think are appropriate and necessary considering the order of magnitude of the risk and the cost of these mega accidents. No. Thank you, Mr. Congressman. Uh, just a couple of things. Uh, we've talked a lot about today, and I've heard the word fail safe, which is it never breaks. And, and I might just offer as, as a framework to answer your question. We tend to think of this question as a self-healing issue, which is we know things will break, but we want to make sure that they're transparent to the customer, meaning there's enough uh, redundancy and other things built into the network. So looking forward, the actions that need to be taken go far beyond some of the things we've already done. Uh, as a member of the industry, we're very much distressed by what happened uh, in the AT&T incident, and we sympathize with them, although we can't fix it or excuse it at this point. But in the future, We've got to look more at redundancy. We've got to look more at testing. As Mr. Darves pointed out, we've got to look at diversity. We've got to look at better training. And that's why under the uh, auspices of the United States Telephone Association, a couple of weeks ago, we put forth a brand new proposal that would add some dimension and depth to some of the existing processes that are going on in the industry today. And we're supporting additional permission to do joint planning between large and small companies. We're talking about tighter and more aggressive standards, 
and we're talking about infrastructure sharing to make sure that large and small companies will be permitted Excuse to take Excuse me, when you actions. talk about tighter and more aggressive standards, who should be setting those standards? Should that be a cooperative matter between the various actors in the private sector, or should that be the FCC finally taking a leadership role? I'm sorry to be evasive, but it's going to be all of the above. Because we have so many providers in the industry. We have equipment suppliers, long distance companies, alternative local exchange competitors, the local exchange companies. I think you will see a fabric woven where all of them must do a lot better and be more aggressive. As Doesn't far as the very diversity of the players that you're discussing now suggest that some kind of central uh, focus, some kind of central planning and direction is utterly necessary to get all those actors working in harmony with each other toward establishing higher and better standards. I'm not quite sure, sir, how we can put all of the forces playing in the industry under one central planning function. But I would submit that in light of the events here, that we need to make sure that all of the, uh, the players change their attitudes to some extent and really be much more aggressive. As far as the local exchange company is concerned, we have very aggressive standards organizations in the state public utility commissions. And I suspect that uh, they will take an active role as, as the uh, commission here in Washington has said it would do this morning. All right, thank you. Uh, Mr. Garrett, uh, we're, I'm concerned, I think others up here are concerned, that the September 17th uh, outage uh, is at least indirectly related to AT&T's zeal to cut its cost and increase its profit margin on the bottom line. <clears throat> the story of failing alarms and inadequate levels of personnel would certainly suggest that this is the case. Uh, do you believe that ATT has enough personnel with adequate training and orientation and attitudinal motivation to monitor its entire network at the present time? Congressman Sawyer, the, uh, the answer is <clears throat> yes, and let me explain. Uh, we've taken a look at our 33 Thomas Street office in terms of the staffing. Uh, it, is a, it is lower than it was uh, a number of years ago, and there are reasons for that. Changes in technology, changes in operating support systems allow us to operate uh, the plant much more effectively and efficiently. So at 33 Thomas, the uh, staffing there was, uh, in my view, clearly sufficient uh, in order to handle uh, the issues that we had. Uh, we did have a power team at, uh, at school, but there were many other power trained people on the, on the floor that day that had they been notified of this shift and the need to check it could uh, clearly have done that. Uh, throughout the country, I believe that uh, we have the right numbers of people uh, to, uh, to very effectively operate and maintain this network. There's no question that we've gone through a period of, of, uh, of resizing the force and consolidation. There are some people issues, I won't duck that. And we're working now our way through each of those people issues. But I believe in terms of the resource, in terms of the talent, that we have what we need to do the job at hand. Well, Mr. Garrett, in your opening statement, you made a very forthcoming and honest opening statement, which implicitly as well as explicitly, you uh, accepted blame. at and accepted, accepted blame for this, these horrific incidents. Now, what changes do you, pro do you propose? Tell us about the, the way you think it might do things a little differently in the future to avoid and prevent the likelihood of such a horrendous event taking place again. Well, the first uh, thing we're going to do is just an immediate uh, review of all our alarms and processes. That's something that is underway and nearing completion now to make sure those are, are understood, are followed, are done, and done right. Well, let me ask you, in that connection, do you have remote alarming at all critical, uh, at all critical local alarms? Do you have remote alarming now? The remote we have many remote alarms, but we do not have remote alarms at all power locations. And that's the second piece we are going to move. Yeah. How about for Thomas Street? Did you have remote 
alarming systems there as a redundancy matter? Congressman, the irony of this is that a remote triple redundant alarm system was in the process of being installed that would turn up in the middle of this month. So we will have be between, uh, by the end of this month, that alarm system installed. In the meantime, we're taking extraordinary measures at 33 Thomas to make sure we don't have a repeat of the incident. Are there any other new extraordinary measures that you plan to take? Doing something a little differently. What lessons have you learned that are going to be expressed in new systems, new approaches, new fail-safe procedures of whatever kind? Um, uh, Congressman, uh, what we have underway, in addition to the procedures and processes, we have a whole program of upgrades to our power plant system that clearly we're going to take and pull forward just as rapidly as we can. Uh, also, we're going to put another level of concern and response into the power issue. I, uh, we're just going to do that, and we're going to do that just as rapidly as we can. In addition to that, uh, we're going to work with customers in terms of their requirements for, for diversity. And I mentioned the FAA. The chairman has asked me specifically to work with the FAA on just as rapidly as we can implementing the already planned diversity for New York City and then going to every air route traffic control center around the country and doing the same. I thank the gentleman. I thank the chairman. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair will recognize himself uh, briefly <clears throat> for a round of questions. And I'd like to just to clarify a couple of things, if I could, uh, Mr. Uh, Garrett, uh, just so that we're clear about one thing. Um, the load uh, sharing agreement with uh, uh, Con Ed uh, is a standard practice, and you're going to internal power it is considered normal and even advantageous because it makes you less dependable upon the commercial grid. Is that not correct? The, uh, the having the backup power is a prerequisite at every central office location we have, and testing that backup power is also a prerequisite. Uh, with the agreement with Consolidated Edison, uh, we felt that we could do the, 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 the whole uh, city location, uh, have that a plus for them because we were taking part of the power, as well as have ourselves with the, uh, the capability to protect ourselves from, from a brownout by doing it on a planned basis. So the problem was not with Con Edison. That, that's a normal agreement that you have. Is that not the, correct? The problem is not with Con Edison. Okay. The problem was with AT&T equipment and the procedures at AT&T. That's, with the, Congressman, that's Mr. Okay. Chairman, that's correct. That's right. Thank you. I just want to get that out on the record. Um, <clears throat> let, me, let me ask uh, another quick question, if I could. In a letter, uh, dated September 20th to Robert Allen, the CEO of AT&T. Chairman Sykes made reference to, quote, steps being taken to assure a fail-safe network. Um, can you give us a guarantee that AT&T has today or will have a fail-safe uh, network? Mr. Chairman, right now there are no guarantees. Uh, we're putting in place, uh, as I went through the, uh, the capital and the expenditures, uh, significant steps in terms of both hardware and software to rapidly improve the reliability of the network and the self-healing nature of that network. To guarantee that there would never be another failure is not something that, that I could do. All right, then, then uh, help us then understand what level of failure is acceptable to AT&T under present conditions? Uh, uh, I think, uh, Mr. Chairman, the best answer I could give without trying to be cute is that no level of failure I, is I acceptable. I do understand that. I'm assuming that uh, you don't want anything to ever go wrong. What, what I'm what saying, we, though, is short of a fail-safe system, what have you built in to your calculations with regard to what is let us say, acceptable uh, risk to run short of having the expenditures made to uh, have a defense in depth that makes uh, it almost impossible for an accident to occur. May I respond on that and then sure. follow on? Please. Um, if, if you wanted to take a look at where our mind is in terms of what's acceptable, uh, 
we would like to have it such that any call traversing the network uh, uh, during the busy hour, only one in a thousand of those calls would be blocked uh, on the first try. I mean, that's our, that's our standard. Now, let me expand on that, if I may, just a bit. What we have seen in the last three or four years, and other carriers have seen this as well, is that we are susceptible to huge spikes. And so where we're focusing our attention now is on taking those spikes and getting them down. The most, uh, uh, the highest cause of those spikes have been fiber cuts. And the way we're getting at that is through fiber loops that we have built that have spare restoration capacity and then very rapid automatic restoration. And if we can take that and get those spikes <coughs> out, which is our intent, then we believe we will be okay. fine in terms of our service. Well, let me just tell you, in, in the uh, response to pre-hearing questions, which we submitted to AT&T, um, we asked if uh, that company would define what a major outage was for the purposes of AT&T planning. And the response that we got was that it would be an outage um, that uh, uh, that affected uh, uh, on a daily basis uh, three percent of the average number of calls. Now, AT&T has 130 million uh, calls uh, daily, and that would mean that 3.9 million calls uh, would be a three percent of that in terms of meeting the definition of major in terms of the AT&T uh, a sense of what was, in fact, uh, a significant outage. Um, now, as you can imagine, uh, 3.9 million is more than all the telephones in uh, Massachusetts, uh, in most of the states of most of the people who sit on this committee. Um, and so, just definitionally, you can understand why we would have some difficulty in accepting such a high level of, of a problem. Uh, still being uh, considered to be something less than major given the consequences for 3.9 million or uh, fewer um, uh, consumers in the country. Can you help us understand why there is such a high threshold that has to be met in order to meet that test? Uh, Mr. Chairman, 3% uh, of the calls not being completed is not our standard. It is not acceptable, absolutely not acceptable. The, uh, the specific question asked to pick a level, define what that was, define what was in it, what was not in it. Uh, we pick 3%. We can pick a, another figure if the, the uh, subcommittee would like and provide you with that information. Um, uh, so the 3% the uh, that we used in our uh, response back was not at all in any way to represent, in our view, an acceptable level of, of performance. All right, and, and uh, finally, Mr. Garrett, you've completed your internal uh, investigation and you've satisfied yourself with regard to the, cause, the causes of the uh, outages. Um, did any of your actions, assuming that they were willful and knowing, violate any of the then existing FCC rules or regulations? Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. Could you, could you rephrase that? Uh, Having now completed your internal yeah. investigation, is it your opinion, or have you formed one yet, with regard to whether or not there was a willful knowing violation of FCC regulations with regard to the procedures which AT&T uh, was operating on that. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I don't believe that there was a uh, willful violation of procedures, no. Uh, what happened was clearly not acceptable, but in terms of a willful violation, no. So you don't expect to be fined then by the FCC? I think that's a, a matter for the FCC to uh, discuss. Uh, I, I, to, to, Mr. Chairman, that has been the furthest thing from my mind right now. What I have been concerned about most was understanding what happened, putting in steps, place steps so it never happens again, and then getting on with other significant steps that will improve our network reliability. Thank you, Mr. Garrett, and uh, I thank the other witnesses as well. I have no other questions at this time. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Alabama, Mr. Harris. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and I would just address this to the panel that, uh, according to a report uh, prepared by the FAA, at a time from August 1990 to August of 91, there was a total number of major, major out outages uh, of 114. And, uh, and just uh, looking through, of course, it's, it's industry-wide. It's not just, uh, it's not AT&T, it's uh, uh, alone. It's, uh, it's, as I said, it's industry-wide. And, and, and this is uh, very much concern to us, and, uh, and, and I'm sure it is to the American people because of the, uh, the, the safety considerations. And, and I think you've touched on it, and, I, and it's probably not anything that anyone really needs to respond to. I, I guess redundancy uh, even though we hate to to uh, repeat ourselves, uh, is, uh, is is the key to a lot to answering a lot of these problems. Mr. Moe, I'd asked you uh, in particular. You stated in your testimony that a number of members of your association are concerned that, tradi that the traditionally high standards of service quality that the local telephone company imposed on itself are threatened. And specifically, you point out that the price cap regulation may give telcos the incentive to continue to rely on older standards that, although appropriate for a network using analog, voice band, metallic technology, that are now inappropriate for a network that is involved into an advanced digital software-controlled optical electronic technology. And I would ask you, what kind of performance measures or standards uh, would you suggest and that you feel are the most appropriate uh, for our new digital world? Thank you, Congressman. We have um, tried to get the Commission to conduct a dialogue in that area for some time. Um, at the moment, we've had little willingness on the part of the FCC to try to conduct that dialogue. It's not something we can do on our own. We have to do it side by side with our vendors in the carrier community to work that out. As we evolve into new levels of electronics that we can connect to the fiber optics, that will set the tone for the various standards for those levels of services. We have asked the FCC, please let us work with the carriers to get these in the tariffs for the various services we subscribe to and then let us make a choice as to whether we'll subscribe to them or not. Uh, at the moment, the FCC has had no uh, willingness to conduct that type of dialogue. Uh, we cannot give you the answers today, or we would have in our prepared testimony, as to what levels of service quality we should have for each type of service unless we can have a uh, interactive dialogue with our vendors and a willingness of the FCC to have that uh, uh, re information be required at the FCC. Well, how would you distinguish between the responsibilities of the states and the FCC in, in this area of performance standards? It, it's been a difficult for one, one for us. We focus mainly on the FCC because it's a resource problem. There are 51 non-federal jurisdictions of 50 states and the District of Columbia. We were hoping that the FCC would take a leadership role in this area to facilitate progress. Um, one of the uh, uh, progress reports, which was not mentioned by the uh, uh, chief of the tariff of the Common Carrier Bureau when he spoke on panel one, was an example given uh, in the September 12 meeting uh, by New York a user in New York where they talked about how the state of New York and the Public Service Commission had brought together users and the carriers and had helped facilitate progress in meeting customer problems and circuit provisioning delays, things like that. We don't have those same types of things happening here at the FCC. Uh, the September 12th meeting was the first occasion we had. Unfortunately, the meeting was closed, so many, op many people didn't even have an opportunity to witness the discussion. Um, hopefully the September 12th meeting is an indication that the FCC is changing, but we don't know yet. Well, I know from the testimony that I heard, I got the impression that, that since this happened, that's all, that's all they've been doing is meeting. Uh, well, as you well know, in Washington, uh, when in doubt, meet and meet. Uh, produce studies. Well, that was the I second thing I was going to ask. They, they've also uh, uh, been performing studies. And, uh, 
And another one that really, I, I think, could probably answer it for us over, they've established staff uh, within the FCC then mandating them to investigate these issues. Uh, I'd, so, I'd add one thing. I think we have a, a tremendous opportunity in this area that wasn't available to us uh, a year ago or two years ago. I think a number of the players in the industry, the carriers in particular, the, the, the monopoly carriers and the FCC, had little desire to deal with the service quality issue that users and others in industry, the long distance community, because they're also customers of the uh, local networks, were constantly raising. Uh, now, by the correspondence you all have been having with, with the FCC, today's hearing, I think we're in a position where if we continue to put pressure on the commission, we might get some progress. Because without things like to today, I don't think that would be possible. Mr. Chairman, I uh, want to thank you for calling this hearing. It's been, I think, uh, hopefully helpful. And I just want to commend uh, all of the panelists and, uh, and, and Mr. Garrett, you in particular, for just coming in and, and, and fessing up. And of uh, course, I think the, that's one of the things that, uh, that we've got to is where we messed up, admitted, and then. Let's all work together to try to improve the system and because we've got so many of the people that depend on it. Thank you. Great. Gentlemen's time has expired. Um, it's clear, it seems to me, that the march of a technology has passed over the Federal Communications Commission. Uh, things have to change at the FCC and they better change soon or Americans will find themselves at increased and consequential risk. Today's testimony makes clear that the FCC does not have a plan to avert disaster. Worse yet, it does not see the potential for disaster as part of its regulatory focus. Because of this, I am going to take a personal role in bringing the FCC to a level of regulatory oversight that can give reasonable confidence to the public that their safety and their interests are not being overlooked at the FCC, which is wedded to a sort of octogenarian activism. It is time for us to have them move uh, into the 21st century. If, uh, if we are going to have modern technologies, then we must have uh, uh, a modern regulatory system. Uh, now we're moving more and more at supersonic speeds in telecommunications technology accompanied by a Haas and buggy era of uh, regulatory mentality. Both have to move along at the same pace. And I think that this hearing makes quite clear that there's a tremendous gulf that exists. Uh, between what uh, AT&T and the other companies uh, can in fact provide in terms of technology and what the FCC uh, is requiring in terms of safety and protection being built in uh, for uh, customers, for our safety, for uh, the system itself. And uh, we will work now hard to bridge that regulatory black hole which has been built over the last uh, generation of technology. With that, we thank all of the witnesses and uh, we thank all of uh, the uh, uh, other attendees for their patience. This hearing is adjourned. The C-SPAN 2 schedule is available to viewers 24 hours a day. For the latest information about our programming, call 202-628-2205.